sharing knowledge and for academic excellence. I wish the conference is a memorable and rewarding experience for everyone. Thank you. Now I would like to request uh, Dr. S.C. Jain sir, Dr. P.K. Gupta sir, Dr. Anjani sir to inaugurate the ceremony by lighting the lamp. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Arun Sarkar, sir, please, please we welcome you for the inauguration of the ceremony, sir. Thank you, sir. Dr. Shekhar Sinha, sir, Dr. Krish, sir, to uh, light the inauguration lamp, sir, please.
Thank you for inaugurating the ceremony, sir. <laughs> By starting the ceremony, I would like to welcome Dr. B.K. Thakur, sir, to share the session, please. Thank you so much, sir. I would like to welcome Dr. B.K. Thakur, sir, to share the session, please. I would also like to invite Dr. P.K. Sinha, sir, Dr. Shekhar Sinha, sir, to share the session, please. Hello. The first session of the uh, morning, and the topic is Spirometry Interpretation Made Easy. For this, I would like to invite Dr. Nishit Kumar, who completed his MD in pulmonary medicine from Lucknow in 2013. He served as senior resident for next three years in SGPGI Lucknow. Dr. Nishit has published a number of original research articles, case reports, and co-authored a book chapter in Update on Respiratory Disease and Allergy. Dr. Nishi's core area of interest lies in interventional pulmonology, especially bronchoscopic and thoracoscopic intervention. He is associated with Orchid Medical Center since last five years. So, Dr. Nishi, please. Namaste and good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule on Sunday morning and accepting the invite. So in next 20 to 25 minutes, I'm going to talk about spirometry and how to interpret it. So I'm fortunate enough to use advanced PFT instrument like AOS and DLCO in my day-to-day -day practice, but I still believe that spirometry is a very important tool and it should be omnipresent in every clinic and hospital setup. So in today's talk, I'm going to cover spirometry under following subheadings. We'll learn about historical perspective and relevance of spirometry in modern times. Then, of course, spirometry is used to measure lung function, lung volume. So understanding a bit about lung physiology is must before interpreting a spirometry result. So we'll learn a bit about lung volumes and lung physiology. What are the indications and contraindications of spirometry? how to prepare a patient for a spirometry maneuver, and last but not the least, how to interpret a spirometry result. So, Mr. Giovanni Borelli was the first person who way back in 1681 used an instrument to measure lung volume. Stephen Hales in 1727 recorded maximum volume of air which he could expire into a bladder. Sir John Hutchinson is the one who coined the term vital capacity and he's the same person who also coined the term spirometer. So he, he also showed that measurement of vital capacity was far sensitive for detection of tuberculosis which was very common during that time in Europe than auscultation via a stethoscope. Again as a doctor working in an insurance company, he proposed the use of vital capacity to predict life expectancy. So as you can clearly see that he was way ahead of his time. So coming back to modern times, Dr. Salvi and Chess Research Foundation, they published a paper in 2012 in journal J JAPI and they found that the health burden of obstructive airway disease like COPD and bronchial asthma is much higher than those due to other non-communicable diseases like hypertension, ischemic heart disease, diabetes mellitus and cancer. So again in India, majority of clinicians diagnose asthma and COPD or obstructive airway disease simply by obtaining a brief history and listening to lung sound by a stethoscope. So what happens whenever someone comes to our clinic, we just take a brief history whether the person is complaining of breathlessness or cough since few years. We take a brief history, then we just auscultate the patient and if you hear bronchi or wheeze, then we level him as a case of COPD or bronchial asthma, then we start him on oral bronchodilator or maybe inhaled medication. But if 
we do this, then we will miss a lot number of patients. So it has been clearly shown that bronchial asthma and COPD are underdiagnosed by 65% if clinicians only rely on history and examination. So spirometry is must. We are only diagnosing the tip of the iceberg if we are only concentrating on the history and auscultatory finding. Again, a nationwide study was conducted by Chest Research Foundation in 2012, and it was reported that less than 10% of GPs, 20% of general physicians, and around 50% of pulmonologists utilize spirometry in their day-to-day -day clinical practice to detect and manage patients with obstructive airway disease. So this number is quite less. Now, spirometry is an objective tool that can not only diagnose obstructive airway disease, but also help in managing them better. Not just obstructive airway disease, but also other lung conditions like interstitial lung disease, bronchiectasis, etc. So what exactly is spirometry? Spirometry is basically a medical test that measures the volume of air an individual inhale or exhales as a function of time. So with the help of spirometry, we can measure force vital capacity, force expiratory volume in one second, PFR, etc. But it can't measure FRC, that is functional residual capacity, residual volume, and total lung capacity. So for that, another instrument is there. So the only problem with spirometer is that we cannot measure residual volume and total lung capacity. So as far as applied physiology is concerned, learning about lung volume is must if you want to interpret a spirometry report. So there are basically four lung volume. One is tidal volume, second one is inspiratory reserve volume, then there is something called expiratory reserve volume and residual volume. Residual volume is the amount of air that remains amount that <coughs> remains inside the lung after forceful expiration. It prevents the lung from lung collapse after forceful expiration. So we cannot measure this by spirometry. Again, if you add two or more volume, it compromises a capacity. So there are five capacities. Inspiratory capacity, expiratory capacity, vital capacity, and functional residual capacity. Again, spirometry cannot measure functional residual capacity, just like residual volume. So what exactly is tidal volume? Tidal volume is the normal amount of air that one inhale or exhale with each breath during quiet breathing. So the normal amount of tidal volume is around 6 to 8 ml per kg body weight. So if someone weighs 50 kg, then the, his tidal volume is around 300 to 400 ml. Then there's something called inspiratory reserve volume. It is the maximum volume of air inhaled from the end inspiratory tidal position. Similarly, there is expiratory reserve volume. It is the maximum volume of air that can be exhaled from resting end expiratory tidal position. And then there is residual volume, which cannot be measured by a spirometer as I have already mentioned. So why perform a spirometry? Why performing spirometry or uh, taking all this trouble is important. Spirometry is not important, not only important to diagnose and assess severity of a range of respiratory condition like asthma, COPD, interstitial lung disease, but it also helps in monitoring the disease progression. So also to assess response to therapies. So if someone comes to you with COPD, you diagnose him using a spirometer and after taking a history, then you put him on bronchodilator and inhaled medication, then you need to assess the response to therapy. Similarly, it, is also play, it also plays important role in preoperative assessment of lung function. So if someone is planned for maybe thoracic surgery or maybe if he's suffering from some lung condition like uh, obstructive airway disease, then you need to do a spirometry as a preoperative assessment. So how to prepare the patient for spirometry? Now, first of all, a dedicated spirometry technician, a motivated person is must for doing spirometry because it is an effort-dependent test, so patient cooperation is must, unlike AOS. So first of all, one need to explain the purpose of the test and demonstrate the procedure to the patient. Again, recording anthropometric data like age, height, weight, and gender along with ethnicity is must into the software because the predicted value comes from this anthropometric data only. Now we need to make a note when bronchodilator was last used, especially if we are planning to do a bronchodilator responsiveness test. Earlier it was called bronchodilator reversibility test. So if someone is on, let's say, Saba, like uh, short acting beta 2 agonist like albuterol or maybe salbutamol, you need to stop it at least six hours before performing the test. Similarly, if someone is on Lama, like formetrol or salmetrol, then you need to stop it at least 24 hours before conducting BDR. Nowadays, 
ultra lama like velentrol and uh, indacatrol is also quite commonly being used in our day-to-day -day clinical practice so if someone is on indacatrol or velentrol you should at least wait for 48 hours before doing a spirometry as far as lama is concerned like glycohale glycoperineum or maybe a titropium you need to stop it at least 32 to 36 hours before doing spirometry but you can continue with LTRA like Montelukast and inhaled corticosteroid. They doesn't interfere in assessing bronchodilator responsiveness. So if someone is wearing tight cloth, so you must advise him to loosen any tight clothing and empty the bladder beforehand if needed. Now certain things needs to be avoided before conducting a spirometry. So patients should refrain from smoking at least one hour prior to doing a spirometry evaluation. They shouldn't consume alcohol within four hours because if there is impairment in neurocognitive, then it may interfere in the test. Again, vigorous exercises should be avoided at least 30 minutes before performing spirometry. And if someone is wearing a tight cloth, then you may ask him to loosen his buttons. Again, eating a large meal within two hours is generally avoided. How to perform a spirometry? Again, since this is a patient effort related test, so counseling is must you must ask the patient to place the lips and teeth tightly around the mouthpiece take a deep breath until the lungs are full slow not forced breath and there should be no breath holding in between now you ask the patient to blow out as forcefully as possible and continue the expiration as far as possible until the lungs feel empty so this the duration of expiration is generally 15 seconds again the patient should perform a minimum of three attempts and a maximum of eight attempt the result reported should be the largest value achieved from the three technically acceptable tests and the difference between the value between the two most acceptable tests should be less than 150 ml or 5 percent. Again the effort should be maximal, it should be smooth and it should be cough free. Now there are two criteria which must be fulfilled if you want to report a spirometry report. One is acceptability criteria and second one is reproducibility criteria. So the spirogram should be free from error, there should be no hesitation or false start, there should be no cough, there should be no variable effort, no glottic closure, no early termination or cutoff, no leaks, many a time patient put their tongue inside the mouthpiece that result in Iranus result. So there should be no obstructed mouthpiece, no baseline error and at least 15 second exhalation or a plateau. Many a times those patients who are suffering from severe COPD, they exhale more than 15 seconds but in most of the instances a plateau is reached by 15 seconds. Again, reproducibility criteria is also important. What it is? Repeatable spirogram without excessive variability between tests. So after three acceptable tests, at least a minimum of three tests should be done while conducting a spirometry test. Two highest value for FVC and FEV1 must be within 150 ml and 5% of each other. Now ATS recommends that minimum of three tests should be conducted and a maximum of eight tests. Beyond that, it is not necessary. So a typical spirometry report looks something like this. At times it is confusing. This is the flow volume loop. This is the volume versus time graph. And this is the various parameters predicted value. So how to interpret it? Now, the three most important parameters that one must know for interpreting a spirometry report is FVC, that is forced vital capacity, FEV1 and FEV1 upon FVC ratio. Again, sometime we also see or check out FEF 2575 for small airway assessment. But nowadays we have got better pulmonary function test equipment like AOS for assessment of small airway disease. So what exactly is FEV1, FVC? FEV1 is the volume of air expired forcefully in the first second of the flow. Similarly, FVC is the total volume of air that can be forcibly exhaled in one minute. And FE1 by FVC is the ratio. So this is the flow volume loop, as you can see in this slide. And this is the volume versus time graph. So a normal spirogram looks something like this. This is the volume versus time graph. So this is the FVC. This is the FEV1, force expiratory volume in one second. So in this particular volume versus time graph, as you can see, the patient had reached the plateau after blowing out for three seconds. And his total force expiratory time is somewhere around 7 seconds. So he has blown out for 7 seconds. 
This is a normal flow volume loop. This is the expiratory loop and this is the inspiratory loop. Again, this portion is called FEF 2575 and this is the vital capacity or force vital capacity. And the tip of the spirogram is PFR, peak expiratory flow rate. So what a predicted value? So if you look over here, you can see the various parameters like Fe1, Fvc and Fe1 upon Fvc and these are the predicted value. So we all know that we have normal reading for hemoglobin, blood pressure, blood sugar, normal BP readings, normal serum creatinine uh, levels, but there are no normal or universal lung function values as they are affected by many parameters like age, height, gender and ethnic origin. So we all know that with increase in age, the lung function gradually decrease, decrease. Similarly, tall people have larger lung volumes and smaller or those people who have shorter height tend to have smaller lung volume. Similarly, gender also affect lung volumes. So lung volumes are smaller in females and ethnic origin also affects the lung volume. So Indians in general have smaller lung volumes compared to their Cococcian colleagues. So what are predicted values? Now interpretation of PFT is usually based on comparison of data measured in an individual patient with reference that is predicted value based on healthy subject. So the reference value are calculated with equation derived from measurement observed in a representative sample of healthy subject in a general population. So we do have Indian data which we use in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. So what spirogram patterns are obtained? Normally we see four kind of patterns. One is normal, second one is obstructive abnormality, second one is restrictive pattern and the fourth one is mixed defect. So we can actually label a person whether he is suffering from obstructive abnormality or restrictive abnormality by looking at the flow volume loop and volume versus time graph. So in case of obstructive abnormality, the rise is slow, expired volume is reduced and prolonged time to full expiration. Similarly, in restrictive lung disease, there is fast rise to plateau at reduced maximum volume and the mixed pattern lies between the two. So similarly, we also evaluate flow volume loop. So this is the normal flow volume loop and this is the flow volume loop which is classically seen in obstructive lung disease. The mid portion is scooped out. Similarly, in severe obstruction, you see a steeple pattern and in restrict restrictive lung disease, the shape of the spirogram is normal, but the volume is reduced, FVC is reduced. Now, many a times we also tend to assess bronchodilator reversibility. For that, what we do, we give the patient a bronchodilator, typically 400 mcg of salbutamol is given with a spacer device. And then after 15 minutes, we measure his FEV1 and FVC. So if someone FEV1 and FVC changes more than 12% of the predicted value or 200 ml from the baseline, then we label that he's having good BDR, that is bro bro good bronchodilator responsiveness. So now how to interpret a spirometry? First of all, we need to assess FEV1 by FVC ratio. And after that, if it is normal, that if it is more than 70%, then we assess FVC. Now, if again FVC is also normal and FE1Y FVC is also normal, then it means that the spirogram is normal. Similarly, if FE1Y FVC is normal and if FVC is reduced, then it means that it is a case of restrictive lung disease. But we cannot label that a person is having restrictive lung disease just on the basis of spirometry. We knew, need further evaluation like radiograph or maybe other tests like DLCO and calculate total lung capacity and all. Similarly, if FEV1 by FVC ratio is less than 0 0.70 and FVC is normal, then it means that the person is having obstructive airway disease. Again, spirometry is gold standard for detecting obstructive airway disease, especially for diagnosing COPD. And if FVC is reduced, then it means that there is mixed defect or there is severe obstruction. Now, what is the role of spirometry in COPD? Now, we all know that there is decline in lung function with increasing age. Similarly, in smokers also, there is sharp decline in FEV1 compared to normal individual. So, as far as gold guideline is concerned, we have classification 
for categorizing various patients into various subgroup like A, B, C, A, and D. So, on Y axis, we have gold classification of airflow limitation, which is spirometric classification of obstruction. And similarly, on the X axis, we have MMRC scale and COPD assessment test score. So, this is the this is the classification which we must know the 80, 50, and 30 rule. So if someone FEV1 by FVC is less than 70%, it means that the person is having obstructive abnormality. And if FEV1 is more than 80, then it means that he is having mild obstruction. Similarly, in case of obstruction, if FEV1 lies between 50 to 79%, then it means that he is suffering from moderate obstruction. And if his FEV1 lies between 30 to 49%, then it means that he is suffering from severe obstructive abnormality. And if his FEV1 is less than 30%, then it means that he is suffering from very severe or grade 4 obstructive abnormality. Now, why is spirometry so important in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Of course, to confirm the diagnosis of COPD, since it is the gold standard test for diagnosing COPD and for diagnosing obstruction, to assess severity of airflow limitation, to estimate lung age. Again, estimation of lung age is very important because there is something called biological age and then there is estimation of lung age which is done on the basis of spirometric evaluation. So if a smoker comes to your clinic and if his biological age is let's say it's 55 and if you do a spirometric evaluation and if his lung age comes to let's say 80 or 85 then you can counsel the patient to quit smoking. Again to check the responsiveness to therapy and monitor progress of disease not only in COPD but also in various other lung conditions like interstitial lung disease. Also, spirometry may detect the presence of mild airflow limitation 5 to 10 years before the symptom becomes evident. So, you can use spirometry as a screening tool whenever a smoker comes to your clinic. Now, what is the role of spirometry in evaluation of upper way obstruction? There, is, there are various kind of upper way obstruction like extrathoracic upper way airway obstruction as well as intrathoracic upper way airway obstruction. So the flow volume loop in upper airway obstruction looks something like this. The FB loop looks like a box pattern in fixed obstruction. Similarly, in variable extrathoracic obstruction, which can occur in vocal cord dysfunction, you see a flattened inspiratory portion of FB loop. Similarly, in variable intrathoracic obstruction, which happens in tracheomalacia or in malignancy, you see a flattened expiratory portion of FB loop. So there are no absolute contraindication as such for performing spirometry. Of course, there is no point in doing a spirometry where you are suspecting infectious disease like maybe tuberculosis. But there are certain relative contraindication. If someone is having active hemoptysis, then there is no point of doing spirometry in such patient. Again, spirometry maneuver results in increase in intrathoracic pressure as well as intracranial pressure so and also in intra-abdominal pressure so we tend to avoid in large aneurysm unstable angina in third trimester of pregnancy or also in immediate post-op period of abdominal and eye surgery as it can raise intra-abdominal and intracranial pressure so this brings us to our last slides Take home message, spirometry is only a diagnostic aid and should always be interpreted with clinical and radiological correlation. FVC is again dependent upon patient's effort. So a reduced FVC should be interpreted with caution. You must get a proper, you must take a proper history and uh, you must check out his radiology before labeling a person as a case of restrictive lung disease. Again, spirometry is the gold diagnosis for COPD and the lack of bronchodilator responsiveness does not preclude a clinical response to bronchodilator. This is very important. Now, along with the evaluation of numerical values, a thorough inspection of flow volume loop and volume versus time graph is must for proper interpretation of spirometry report. Also, I must say that before reporting a spirogram, you must assess whether it is fulfilling the reproducibility and repeatability criteria or not, or acceptability criteria. Now, just like a spignomanometer or BP instrument, thermometer or X-ray or ultrasound, spirometer is an equally important instrument which should be omnipresent in each and every physician's clinic and hospital. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Thank you. 
So we are also conducting a advanced PFT workshop after lunch. So anyone who is having any doubt or want to see how spirometry is performed can join the session after lunch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nishit, for explaining spirometry in a very simple and informative way for the benefit of all the audience. Thank you, thank sir. You. Thank you, sir. In earlier days, we used to have a spirometer, which was a long tube and in, in which the patient is made to blow, blow very hard and see whether it is 100 So the maneuver remains the same today also. Uh, the patients still have to blow very hard, but the instrument has become uh, small in size. Now there are uh, handhold spirometers which are easily available in market and they are quite cheap uh, in price. But uh, nowadays we also have advanced instruments like uh, airwave oscillometry. Dr. Sabal Moitra sir will be talking about airwave oscillometry. It is a new device. Uh, it is not exactly a new device, but it has come into vogue nowadays. So again, spirometry is an effort dependent test. Uh, patient need to put in lots of effort and at the same time, the technician also need to motivate the patient for uh, all the spirometric maneuver. But there are certain effort independent tests which requires less of patient cooperation like AOS, IOS or FOT device. So Dr. Saibal Moitra sir will be covering about those after some time. Now those devices which we use, we even tell patients to keep it at home and keep a record of their uh, vital capacity using that machine. Uh, but doesn't give a printout, you just read it, directly read it. Is that uh, actually most of the machine <coughs> can be connected to a computer, even all those handheld machine, they can be connected to a computer and you can take out the printout report. You, you can take out the report using a printer. <coughs> Huh? Okay. Okay, he's talking about PFR. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. PFR is also an important tool, especially in those uh, patients where you need to assess diurnal variation or also uh, those patients who are suffering from bronchial asthma, you can give them a PFR meter. It is easily available in market and uh, uh, you can actually calculate uh, <coughs> the maximum PFR for that particular patient taking into regard his age, height, sex, etc. And then you can label it into various sections like green, uh, yellow and uh, red color and then you can tell him to monitor his PFR on daily basis. Suppose if it goes below 80% then he may escalate his uh, inhaled medication or he may come to you or other doctors. That's exactly what. Yeah, I okay. So PFR is again a very important tool, which we rarely use in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. Yeah. And it is easily available, it is quite cheap. I would like to request Dr. P.K. Sinha, sir, to hand over the memento to Dr. Nishit, sir. Thank <coughs> you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the session, sir. I would like to invite Dr. Anil Kumar Akalwar sir, Dr. Sudhi sir, Dr. UK Oja sir to come on the stage, uh, stage to share the session. Thank you. Thank you sir. I would like to request Dr. Anil Kumar Agarwal sir to invite Dr. Angira Das Gupta ma'am to share the session. Good morning everyone. At the outset, I must thank Dr. Nishit for inviting us for this program today. And uh, after a long time, we are having an offline session. And uh, as we all know that morbidity and mortality in uncontrolled asthma and severely uncontrolled asthma has been very high. The quality of life in such patients is poor and over the last few years we have emerging biologics as targeted therapy especially aimed for such patients. And to talk on that subject, the emerging role of biologics in severe asthma, we have Dr. Angira Das Gupta, she is MD in pulmonary medicine, DNB respiratory diseases, MRCP UK, MNAMS, FCCP US and PhD. She has more than 26 publications in peer-reviewed journals. 
Her special areas of interest remain clinical applications of measurements of airway inflammation, bronchoprovocation tests and its clinical application, mechanisms and treatment of severe obstructive airway diseases, biomarkers and phenotyping of airway diseases. She is working as additional chief health director in medicine and in charge of the Department of Respiratory Medicine, B.R. Singh Hospital and Center for Medical Education and Research, Eastern Railways, Kolkata, India. She is a postgraduate teacher and thesis guide for DNB courses since 2004. Thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. Uh, at the end of today's talk, I propose to do a quiz, and I hope everybody will participate in that. It's quite interesting, because it's going to go online, and we can see the results as soon as we come. It's something, an indigenous form of whatever happens with the keypads when the ACCP conferences are held. So today I've been invited to talk on emerging role of biologics in severe asthma, and I thank heartily to all uh, the conference organizers. Uh, I thought in today's objectives uh, in my presentation would be phenotyping to endotyping, how we discuss the different endotypes of airway inflammation, and most importantly, which patient gets which biologic. Uh, this slide essentially shows that we, like we all know, that the treatment of asthma is in a stepwise fashion, step one, two, three, four, five, and the step fifth, five, or the fifth step is where we consider patients who are not controlled asthmatics who add biologics such as anti-IgE, anti-IL-5, and we'll talk about that in more detail in this presentation. So why do we need biologics at all? It's because even after treating in the standard way or in the conventional way, five to 10% of asthmatics still remain asymptomatic despite the best available therapies. Some of our patients of severe asthma require long-term oral corticosteroids, and which comes not only with asthma relief, but with comes with a lot of side effects. And biologics help us to taper off the dose of oral corticosteroids. So now the million dollar question, which biologic is meant for which patient? For that, we need to do a phenotyping and an endotyping. Phenotyping is what we see in the clinics, uh, in all our severe asthma clinics. And endotyping is trying to understand what the underlying mechanism for this particular phenotype of asthma is. And for that, I think the best approach is to do a mechanistic approach. For example, would that remain in the background? So the way I usually think about my patients, phenotype or endotype is to try and understand what is the mechanism that's driving the asthma in that patient. So when a severe asthma patient comes to the clinic and we go through all the history and check for all the different medications that the patient has got, it's essentially a step five patient who will require biologic. And the first step to do is to find out a biomarker which is exemplary of a certain phenotype. So how do we find out which patient is a eosinophilic patient, which patient is a neutrophilic patient, etc. For that, we have several biomarkers, and it is up to us to find out the correct one for the specific patient. I think I, there's an echo which is happening. So I am getting feedback. Uh, so the biomarkers are blood cells, such as eosinophils, serum mediators, such as periostin, total immunoglobulin, and allergen-specific immunoglobulins. You could do uh, sputum cells and, uh, and the supernatant uh, protein measurements. You could do an exhaled breath enol. We all know pheno, volatile organic compounds, and urine metabolomics. Thank you for putting off the AC. So uh, the best sample to look for a certain biomarker is essentially blood, because it's easily corrected. 
but it does not mean that uh, blood sample and testing for certain specific things is the end of all investigations. What do we look for biomarkers uh, in blood? Eosinophil count. Now, uh, what is the eosinophil count that we are looking at? The cutoff. It is more than equal to 300 cells per cubic millimeters. And when this happens in a particular person, we can predict that this person is going to respond to steroids or monoclonals such as mepolizumab, benralizumab, et cetera. A raised serum IgE is, is a place where we would think about anti-IgE, that's omalizumab. Allergen-specific IgE re, uh, predicts response to specific immunotherapy. And periostin levels help in understanding that this patient might respond to anti-IL-13. Okay. So what do we do with these measurements? We try to find out whether the patient is a TH2 high patient, which means that if the patient's asthma is driven by eosinophils, or it could be a TH1, that's a neutrophil driven mechanism where we do not get as, uh, eosinophils that much, and a B cell mechanism, that is the IgE related asthma. So essentially, if you think of the patient who walks inside your clinic with severe asthma, and we try and understand the underlying mechanism, there are possibly more than these three, but these three are the most basic things which we can practice in our own clinics. TH2 or eosinophil driven disease, TH1 neutrophil driven disease, and B cell mechanism. Unfortunately, there is a lot of overlap between these phenoendotypes. You can see a patient could have multiple of them at the same time, and it is up to us to understand this uh, diagram because during the overlap periods, we have to understand which element is the predominant one in that patient. Otherwise, the phenotyping might go wrong. So phenotyping with the available tools, I've just described this, serum IgE, it's a B cell mechanism. For high TH2, it's blood eosinophils. For ongoing airway inflammation, it's pheno. And the one that I marked in yellow is the one that tells us the entire story accurately is sputum quantitative assay, which is high T2 versus low T2 can be understood very clearly. Now this man here, Harry Moro Brown, was the person who first found that approximately half the patients had improvement with corticosteroids, whereas the rest were not. For some reason, examining the sputum or the blood for eosinophils fell off fashion for quite a number of years. And after that, this man here, Freddie Hargreave, picked up the method of doing a sputum quantitative assay and popularized it to describe three main components of airway disease. Now, this is not all in the textbook, but when you look at this, you will find this is the most rational approach that we have ever seen in severe asthma. So what are the components? Airflow obstruction, airway hyperresponsiveness, and the central and most important component is the airway inflammation. So how do we measure airflow obstruction? We had a very nice lecture by Dr. Nishir a while ago. So people should be able to answer this. How do we measure airflow in obstruction? Spirometry. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not sure if we are allowed answers from this side of the audience. It's parametry. There should not be any doubt at all, it is parametry. How do we measure airway hyperresponsiveness? BDR. BDR. So our students, when they write the history in the BHT notes, they write, K C O C A D H T N D M C O A D and it goes on and on and on. <laughs> so uh, I would rather say bronchial hyperresponsiveness than say BHR. And how do we measure airway inflammation? No, sir. <laughs> this is what we will be discussing in the. Huh? I can't hear, yeah? Pheno, okay, so we'll see what pheno shows us. So airway inflammation is by doing a 
sputum quantitative assay, right? So when we do a blood test, what do we find? We find there are total cell counts and differential cell counts. Here too, when we do a complete test, we find the total cell count and differential cell counts. So the differential counts allow us to phenotype or endotype our patients. The description or the definition of eosinophilic airway inflammation is that if the eosinophils are more than 3% with a normal total cell count in sputum, then it is eosinophilic. And what are we supposed to do if these patients are eosinophilic? Give them steroids. Yeah. Any of the routes would do. You could give an oral corticosteroids. You could give an inhaled corticosteroids, depending on the severity of the inflammation. Airway inflammation can be neutrophilic when it's more than 65% neutrophils with or without an increase in total cell count. So if you have a report which says that the total cell count is increased and the neutrophil counts are more than 65%, maybe 70, 75, what do we do here? <laughs> Antivirals. Antibiotics, okay. Why not antifungals? Now, this is what we are trying to interpret, right? So, um, in the blood, if you would see a raised total cell count, a raised neutrophil percent, what do we do? Antibiotics. We don't think of anything else. So, I was just trying to find out if this answer was uh, okay for everybody. So if it's neutrophilic, what do we do? Give antibiotics. We do not give steroids. Combined, when there is eosinophilic plus neutrophilic airway inflammation, we first give an antibiotic, recheck to see if there is any change after the antibiotic course, and then treat accordingly. Postgranulocytic is when there are normal cell counts. Now, people might be here who are sitting around thinking, why do we do this sputum test? Why can't we just do with the blood test? That gives you enough information, right? So why is sputum and not be satisfied with blood? Okay, so I'll put the answer like this, that when you check blood lipids, we are not trying to find out what the blood sugar is, right? If you want to see how much the blood sugar is, you would not do a blood for lipids. So if you're trying to un uh, find out what is the inflammatory nature of the airways, why would we do a blood test? We can, we, the test that should be done is the airway inflammation assay, or the sputum quantitative assay. Let's see if you can understand what the endotype of this patient is. So this is a 50-year-old gentleman, a never smoker, asthma since the late 20s, having recurrent exacerbations, three in the previous year, requiring short courses of corticosteroids, allergic to dust, also has rhinosinusitis, nasal polyposis, father had asthma, a 16-year-old son, just started to be breathless with exercise, maybe he has exercise-induced asthma. The patient is on treatment with high doses of uh, inhaled corticosteroids, LABA, this is again the KCO, HT, and DM story, LAMA and LTRA. So LABA is a long-acting beta agonist, long-acting muscarinic agonist, and a leukotin receptor antagonist. Yeah, so he had documented sputum eosinophilia once. His specialist decides to maintain him on a low dose of prednisone, 75 milligrams. So... Presumably, what is the phenotype or endotype of this patient? TH2 type. TH2 type. Uh, better, we should call the patient an eosinophilic type. Because sometimes these terms, a TH2, may, may not be ringing any bell at all. So, further investigation revealed that the patient had a obstructive disease as you can see, the FEV1 by FVC is 50%, pre-bronchodilator FEV1 is 62 and there are improvements with bronchodilator. The HRCT thorax was normal, total IgE 180, absolute eosinophil count 
0.2 microliters in blood. So what is the phenotype of the patient? This is something we get in our everyday practice all the while. So what, what do we say? Do we give her corticosteroids? Do we give her antibiotics? Do we give her both? I would be very happy if people said both because that's what we do in the clinics. But is that what we should be doing? My answer to this would be no. We need to see why this patient's asthma is not controlled and these investigations actually do not give me the complete picture. So what do we do next? We have to give the patient biologics, right? Because there are ha patients are having repeated exacerbations, repeated lung function loss. So we have to consider biologic. And again, which of that? So these are some of the biologics that are in, the, uh, in use as well as in the pipeline. You can go through and see that in nearing the 2020s, we had a certain burst of number of biologics in the, in the market. Mipolizumab, Reslizumab, Benralizumab, Dupulizumab, Tranuikilumab, and I'm not reading it out anymore. So if we need to identify the phenotype of this patient and prescribe a, an accurate biologic for him or her, we would need what is called these sputum biomarkers. Now if we add the sputum quantitative assay to whatever information we have been getting so long, we find that this patient has a total cell count of 9 million that's raised with a 60% neutrophil, 10% eosinophil and an exhaled NO of 45. So I think the confusion has been cleared to a certain extent. This patient is definitely an eosinophilic severe asthma. So what do we have to do? We have to give biologics which target eosinophils. I do not think there is any necessity to go through this, this uh, figure completely. But what I intend to tell you in by showing you this figure is that there are two important pathways. One is an alternative pathway, another is the canonical pathway of eosinophils being uh, produced by the body in more and more numbers. So one of the pathways is that when the virus bacteria cause epithelial damage, alarmins are secreted IL-33, 25, and TSLP, they activate the resident IL, uh, in the cells in the lymphocyte, the ILC, or the innate lymphocytes in the uh, cells in the airways. So the airways also have cells which are present in the blood. Now, if this happens in the airway, the eosinophil poiesis happens in the airways only, and then we get the rest of the uh, phys pathophysiology of asthma increased secretion of IL-5, eosinophils being homed into the uh, bloodstream, and the rest of it. Opposed to this, we have the pathway of eosinophils which are via the blood. So this is from the sputum, and the second pathway is from the blood. It is very, very similar, but if it's in the blood, uh, where do you think the eosinophils are then discoverable? We want to do an assay we find that there are blood cell counts of eosinophil counts which are very high. Does that mean that if we do a sputum assay, we will get similar results? Or it's just, it doesn't match? We need to do both the tests. Now, why is that? Because if we compare the blood eosinophils to the sputum eosinophils, they are quite discordant. If one goes up, it doesn't mean that the other one goes up as well. It could be that the sputum eosinophil count is high, whereas the blood count is low, and that is what was discussed a while ago, and very beautifully answered by, I'm not sure <laughs> what your name is, but she, he has answered very well. So 
when we do a set of investigations to understand the phenotype or the endotype of this particular patient, we have to do a blood count, sputum counts, IgE, pheno. Now, integrating all these results together is what is going to give us the proper invest, uh, endotype of the patient. Most of the cases that we find in our day-to-day -day practice is an eosinophilic phenotype, and the available interleukins are lepolizumab, reslizumab, not in our country, and bendalizumab. So now we have two uh, biologics plus, yes, omanizumab, two anti-eosinophil biologics, that is mepolizumab and bendalizumab, and we have to, the price comparisons are not there, so it gives us the immense responsibility to accurately find out which anti-IL-5 we would be presenting to the patient. So when all the mepolizumab trials were done initially in the late 90s, what happened was all of them failed. They said mepolizumab was not at all an effective drug. It does not work at all. But that was not the case. We ha it was just that we could not phenotype or endotype the patients correctly. If you look at the exacerbation history, you would see that these patients needed exacerbations of more than two in a year, and these exacerbations would be treated by systemic steroids successfully, which meant that these patients had surely eosinophilic phenotype. And the eosinophilic inflammation would be that in the past 12 months, the blood eosinophil level was somewhere around more than 300, sputum eosinophils raised, FENO raised, and there was deterioration of asthma control once the inhaled corticosteroids or the oral corticosteroids were tapered off or discontinued. So these conditions actually tell us that this patient is an eosinophilic patient very, very accurately because of the increased number of measurements that we have done, and all these measurements point towards the single phenotype of an eosinophilic disease. And when we did that, mepolizumab certainly showed a good number of decrease in exacerbations over time. So mepolizumab works for eosinophilic disease. Blood eosinophils to guide anti-IL-5 therapy, again we find that IL-5 was successful in reducing the blood eosinophils. So if we have a patient of severe asthma with eosinophilia in the airways, blood, etc., the drug of, that we would be thinking of is an anti-IL-5. The names are mepolizumab, benralizumab. The second phenotype is identified by doing a sputum assay again, and this phenotype cannot be identified doing a simple blood test. So you have to have a sputum quantitative assay to understand the nature of inflammation in these patients. So I don't want people to go through this figure again. It's just to emphasize that there are certain targets that, uh, that make us understand that this is a Th1 type if, uh, endotype, and this patient is not going to need oral corticosteroids or inhaled corticosteroids. He or she would do fine with perfectly a course of antibiotics. There you go. Now, this biologic, anti-CXCR2, this is an anti-neutrophil agent, and it did show a reduction in the neutrophil counts in blood, but it did not work very well. Uh, there were lapses here and there. But the most important concern of using an anti-neutrophil agent is that when we are using an anti-neutrophil agent, the neutrophils are again cut off. Now, if the neutrophils are cut off, all sorts of infections might just creep into the patient. So it's better we do not use this sort of a biologic, at least at present. So we have done with two, two of the phenotypes. One is a eosinophilic and neutrophilic. The third is a B cell mechanism or serum IgE-mediated disease. There we go. So the biologic that works in patients who are atopic, that's have a raised serum IgE, is omalizumab. 
and it has been found repeatedly that it consistently improves the quality of life and the number of emergency visits in patients. And this is the most recent biologic that we have got in our armamentarium. It is anti-TSLP. So remember when the allergens hit the epithelium, certain cytokines were secreted, the alarmins, they are TSA, one of them is TSLP, and the other two are IL-23 and 33, 25 and 33 actually. So what does anti-TSLP do when we give it to a patient? The mucosal eosinophil counts are reduced, irrespective of the levels of inflammatory biomarkers at baseline. So what this study essentially is telling us is that if you give an anti-TSLP, it's only the eosinophils that go away and not the other type of cells. So this is a little bit difficult to believe, but I think there is much of research necessary to sort out this sort of a contradiction. And this is my last slide. Segmentation of asthma therapeutics, that is how do we integrate the clinical information with the biomarker and try and understand which biomarker would be successful in the patient. Okay? So if you had atopy, reversible airflow obstruction, a raised IgE and eosinophils, which is the drug that we would be trying out, the biologic? The only, huh? the only reason I want you to shout out this answer is because we want it to be here and not forget. So what is the asthma uh, biomarker or the drug that which would be given our patient if a B cell mechanism is found is? Omalizumab, yes. If it's atopy, mucus hypersecretion, and uh, a lot of airway hyperresponsiveness, serum periostin is high and pheno is high. We didn't discuss this that much because it's not available here. Is anti IL 13, that is lebrikizumab. Severe asthma, frequent exacerbations, a lot of sputum eosinophils, a lot of blood eosinophils. It's obviously anti IL 5, and we have just heard the names mipoli, benrazizumab. If the patient has an atopy, rhinosinusitis, aspirin sensitivity, with a lot of hyperresponsiveness and sputum eosinophils, it's anti. A mechanistic approach using the available biomarkers is the knees of the R. Sputum quantitative assay has the ability to phenoendotype even in clinical practice, and it's not a research tool only. I want everybody in this hall to understand that sputum quantitative assay is not a research tool. It is a clinical tool. It is something which can be done very easily, provided you have interest in doing that. But I'm sure all pulmonologists would be interested in doing that. It has its unique place in management of airway diseases in the era of omics and biologics. So thank you very much. And let's see if we can work this quiz out. OK, so everybody has their mobile phones, right? So are you interested in doing this, yeah? So go to the page www.voxvote.com. OK? In that page, you will find it says Vox Vote Live. Yes, did you get it? Done? So are they asking for a pin somewhere? Even, Even number, good. So it's the pin. 265-279. Got it? OK. So let's see how, whether we can do the uh, live thing. Can I have the first question, please? Look at your mobiles. Hit this. Done? Next question. Can we have the next question, please? Sure. 
Second question? Okay. Just a minute, he has to hit the start button. Now you answer. Everybody got it? So, which biologic targets eosinophil specifically? Was the question. And what do I think about this? Nobody paid attention. <laughs> Either that or I was a very bad speaker. You did not understand anything. So what is the answer? Which biologic targets eosinophil specifically? No? Okay, so we'll move on to the next. The answer here is Reslizumab. Oh, so this is the answer. Again, Omanizumab by a lot of people. And who said none of the above? <laughs> okay, next question, the third question. Which of the following is an anti-IL-3-4 blocker? Hey, it's, ah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my god. Shoivalda is laughing away. <laughs> so which one is an anti-IL-13? So is it dupilimumab? Possibly yes. Benralizumab, anti-IL-5, lebrikizumab, anti-IL-13, mipolizumab, anti-IL-5. So which one is an anti-IL-13-4 inhibitor? Anybody wants to change the answer? No? Eighth. Lebricizumab is the largest group, so I'm happy now. Next question. Next question, please. Which of the following is an IL-5 receptor blocker? Start. Start, start, start. Yeah, now you can plug in your answers. How many users? Four. Mm. Fifteen. Not a koto. Eight. Receptor blocker. IL-5 receptor blocker. So that's the clue. Mipolizumab blocks IL-5. Benralizumab blocks the receptor. Okay. And the last question, which absolute eosinophil count is considered significant to define eosinophil phenotype? Start, please. No, keep it at start. Keep it at start. We want more people to answer. Keep it at start. How many people have pressed two? I think we'll repeat this for our first one. Start. Just do it. We have the answer there. Okay. So it's either 300 when a single measurement is taken and I didn't tell you this, but I'm telling you now, if there are two measurements of 150, that is also considered to be an eosinophilic phenotype. And of course, the patient has to have an exacerbation in the past, which is, resp which is responsive to corticosteroids. Okay. I think we are done for today. Thank you very much for helping and participating. I think it's six months. Six months. Okay. Now people are <laughs> so
So, I don't think we will have Th questions because I have asked enough oh. questions. Thank you, Dr. Angira, for such an interactive session on the phenotypic management of the bronchial asthma. But I doubt that the it is feasible in our setting because of the high cost of the biologics. Sir, I have a humble submission. It means that every time we keep doubting ourselves, we lose our self-esteem. And once you lose your self-esteem, you cannot do anything new. But everybody can go into a garden of which is full of roses. But how many of us are willing to actually make that garden, plant the flower, and then use the rose? So I would invite everybody here to please be proactive. It's time we did something new and not just sit along when others work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful session, ma'am. I would like to welcome Dr. Krishna Kumar, sir, Dr. P.K. Gupta, sir. I would like to request Dr. Krishna Kumar, sir, to invite Dr. Sebal Mutra, sir, to share the session. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to in, uh, introduce Dr. Saibal Moitra uh, to this audience. His topic of discussion is airwave oscillometry. I understand this is a technique with which, even without forced expiration, one can measure the lung functions. And this is what he's going to teach us. Uh, he is MD, PhD, MAMS, FRCP Edinburgh, FCCP US. He has been an adjunct professor and senior consultant, Division of Allergy and Immunology, Department of Respiratory mm -hmm. Medicine, Apollo Multi Specialty Hospital, Kolkata. He has numerous publications to his credit, both in international and national journals. And he is the principal investigator of nearly a dozen extramural projects. So. Dr. Saibal Moitra, sir, we are eager to hear you. Thank you, respected chairperson. And I must thank and the organizer team, Dr. Nishet at Orchid Medical Center for inviting me in this today's program. It's called RICS 2022. So you recently just heard two very excellent talks, one by Dr. Nishit, where he spoke about the spirometry, which we all know is the basic lung function test which we need to carry out and has to be popularized, just like taking a BP or measuring a temperature, getting an ECG done. Then we had another very elaborate talk by Dr. Ungira Dasgupta, where she spoke about the pseudomintometry, basically the uh, use of biologics. So if you have, if you remember that in one of her slides, she showed that there are three main aspects when we talk about the airway diseases. One is the airflow obstruction, another is the airway hyperresponsiveness, and third is the airway inflammation. For airway inflammation, she discussed in detail, airway hyperresponsiveness, that is a bronchoprovocation test, is not the scope of my today's talk. But one very important component is the airflow obstruction. We all know, like the asthma and the COPD, they are obstructive airway diseases. So in that sense, we have to pick up the airflow obstruction, which could be fixed or it could be variable. Now, there's an important caveat in this. When we're picking up an airflow obstruction and we are doing a test like the spirometry, basically what happens is that there's a big zone in the lungs which we call a silent region. Why the silent region? Like the zone in the 
small, the resolve of the small airways, it is which are less than two millimeters in in diameter. I think if if this this thing can be put off, then the clarity of my voice would be better. Anyway, so now when we talk about this small airway disease, now this is an extensive area in the lungs, and we know that basically in the adults, this is a small airway, they constitute less than 2% of the total airway resistance. So when we intend to find out the airflow obstruction and when the obstruction has begun in the small airways as in asthma and also in our in COPD, then for a large extent, for a large long period of time, we won't be able to pick it up in through the spirometry because until and unless there is an extensive area involvement more than 60 percent it does not reflect upon showing an obstruction in the in the airflow in the spirometry so though the measurement of the airflow obstruction is an important tenet in understanding or a more important paradigm in any airway diseases but the sensitivity of a test like the spirometry is low when it comes to measuring the airflow obstruction especially when this occurs starting in the small airways so here comes the role of the oscillometry now oscillometry is basically you can think of as an add-on to the spirometry or maybe a test which is supplementary to the spirometry. Well, in children, it might be a test which can replace the spirometry later on. That is something else. So I would discuss that what is this oscillometry? Means how do we go about in doing this test? What parameters it actually measures? And what these parameters tell us? And I would be showing only maybe one example. So rest of the thing we can and have it in during the workshop time. So oscillometry is nothing, but basically what we do is that we throw sound waves into the airways. Now these sound waves, as you'll understand, that these are miniature pressure waves. So when this is going inside the airways, it gets reflected from the airways and the tissues around it and it again comes back and it is being measured through a transducer. Now this sound wave, when this is being projected on the top of the airflow that we are inhaling and exhaling, that is of tidal breath, it causes a minor deflections in the flow depending upon the energy within that sound wave and that energy is basically depends upon the amplitude of the sound wave. Okay. So there is small pressure waves, so sound waves are small pressure waves which are sent inside the airways through the tidal breathing which is going to cause a very small and minor deflections in the flow which is measured by the pressure flow transducers and this is there in the, at the, when, means at the mouth and this variation in the pressure flow transdu uh, this, this pressure flow relationship, it gives the characteristics of several parameters which we measure. And through these parameters, we tend to understand what is there inside. So this is just like a, the principle of a sonar. Okay. So now, depending upon the type of the oscillatory signal that is sent, we have the types of the oscillometry. Now, it could be a, like monofrequency oscillations, like a sound wave of five hertz, it's sent, it comes back, and then it is measured, okay? And then we see the how much flow variation has occurred between the sound wave which was thrown inside and which, which came out. So this could be one. Or it could be like a, a series of sound waves being sent inside at the airwaves of various frequencies maybe 5, 10, 12, 20, 25 hertz. And when all these sound waves are coming back, then the computer, it actually calculates the variations in the flow 
because of each individual sound waves. So this is what we call a pseudo-random noise oscillations or the PRM oscillations. Then the more recent thing is the impulse oscillations. What are impulse oscillations? In impulse oscillations, basically, so there is a, a computational uh, technique which is called a fast Fourier transformation. We need not know anything about this fast Fourier transformation. What we only need to understand is that by this computational method which came up pretty late and it was Michelson who just came up with it in 1970s. So what he did is that the, all the sound waves of various frequencies from 5 to 20 hertz they were combined in impulses, the square wave impulses and these impulses were then thrown into the airways at a fixed frequency of 5 hertz. Now when these impulses came back, so maybe an impulse containing many individual sound waves integrated into it went inside, that impulse came back and the machine then integrated the flow pressure relationship and found out and dissected the frequency dependent changes in the entire airway. So that is the impulse oscillations. So basically either we are using the monofrequency oscillations or the pseudo random noise oscillations or the impulse oscillations the result they all give is the same so it is only the type of the oscillations that we throw inside depending on that the machine varies so commonly we use over here either a pseudo random noise oscillations the very common thing that we use is the air wave oscillations or the AOS that is actually pseudo random noise oscillations or we can have and also we have this impulse oscillation that is impulse oscillometry or the IOS. So these are the two common machines that we have in our hand either a pseudo random noise oscillation so the air wave oscillations or an impulse os oscillation. So this is just as to what uh, the types we have but uh, the result that they give is the same and how do we interpret the results is also same. So this is what is the FOT technique I've just told about that at what happens is the sinusoidal sound waves which goes goes inside and then it come, comes back and we measure the changes in the pressure and flow. So this is the IOS that is the this is square wave well I think it's not visible over there. Anyway, so these are the square wave oscillations that, that goes inside. So this is, you can see this is the fast Fourier transformation, the FF Fourier synthesis of the square waves. This is of not much clinical significance. Now these are, this is, in this is diagram, you can see that there are sound waves of various frequencies but of similar amplitudes. So this one is, is basically, this is a sound wave of a lower frequency and this is a sound wave of much higher frequency and this is the tidal breadth. Now when these sound waves are superimposed on the tidal breadth, what we get is a composite pressure wave which is going inside and this composite pressure wave it comes back and then the machine can actually it discriminate between the pressure changes of the tidal breadth and the pressure changes and the flow changes of the sound sound waves and that's you can discriminate and then it can give us the results okay so now this is what was I was saying the sound wave basically pressure waves and so this is basically the pressure flow rela relationship now this is what is a very the technique is very simple this is an oscillometry which sends the sound waves of various frequencies which is passed over the tidal breadth then we measure the airway parameters and that's how we give the results. Now let us come at what parameters we measure in the oscillometry. It basically gives one significant parameter which it calls an impedance. Impedance is actually an, another way of saying a resistance or an, another way of saying an airflow obstruction. Impedance we all know that this is an impediment which is caused to the flow of any pressure wave. So that is what is impedance. So impedance is actually translated as a form of the airway obstruction. But we will see later on 
that in oscillometry it means something more also. But to begin with, this is one of the features which tells about the airway obstruction. Now this impedance in oscillometry is subdivided into two major fractions. One is a resistant fraction, another is a reactive fraction. Now what is resistance fraction? Resistance, resistance simple that when any pressure wave is flowing through a tube, the resistance that it gets in the flow of the pressure wave is the resistance. Now what is reactance? Reactance, this is where the problem arose because it took all of us much time to understand what this reactance is and what does it tells us about the lungs or the airways. So reactance is also another form of resistance like when a sound wave is going passing through a tube. So apart from the resistance which is offered to its flow, there's another component which is called reactance which is also a type of the resistance which also impedes the flow of the sound wave. So that's why we call it a reactance and we add both the two together and we get the overall resistance or the what we say an overall impedance of the air airways. Okay, so this is just a schematic diagram of an oscillometer. So you can see here is the mouthpiece and this is the loudspeaker which actually sends the sound sound waves is obviously a bacterial filter and when it comes back there is this the pneumo pneumotachograph which actually measures the changes in the flow and gives the result of uh, what we see. So if we just look that here there is a loudspeaker, the sound wave is going inside and just this has gone inside the lung, the part which is reflected back again comes comes back and this is then measured by the flow trans transducer. Very simple, uh, this nothing much of the patients and actually effort is not needed in this process, this is an effort independent and mechanism. We have seen that in, in spirometry it's an effort dependent process, it's an effort independent one and so it's very easy to perform, only the person has to breathe normally which we all do. So this is the one of the biggest advantage where it comes. So where we cannot do the spirometry like in very young children or maybe even in the ventilated patients or maybe very old patients or patients uh, who have difficulty in understanding what you are saying, who cannot cooperate properly and give a good force vital capacity maneuver. Uh, so this is one technique which comes in hand. So this pressure flow transducer I have said it does nothing but it seeks it's the impulses or the flow which has come to it, differentiates between the flow changes according at individual frequencies and gives the result. Now so this is this Ohm's law I am not going to say detail because you all know so resistance is actually, it is given by the pressure divided by the flow, so that, that's how it differentiates. Now see what happens. Now, a sound wave of a lower frequencies usually has less as energy, that is energy dissipation is less in the sound waves of lower frequency. So that's why these lower frequency sound waves, they can traverse a long distance before getting dampened. So why it get dampened high frequency, high frequency sound waves have more energy dissipation. So the flow it generates when the pressure goes inside, it gets dissipated very quickly and when it comes, it cannot traverse to a long distance. So if you are flowing, uh, giving a sound wave of the 5 hertz, it will traverse the entire system and go till the periphery of the lungs and again it can come back. So the resistance, if we say the 5 hertz uh, sound wave, it will give the resistance parameters or whatever parameters we measure of the entire airways. But if you are throwing in a sound wave of say higher frequency, like say 20 hertz, this higher frequency sound wave cannot traverse long distances. So what happens is that this frequency sound waves 
can only travel in the upper airways or the larger airways and then it comes back from there. So whatever information we will get if we throw a sound wave of the 20 hertz that information will only be of the larger airways. So you can see very well that uh, here that is the 20 hertz sound wave can give information only of the larger airways but the 5 hertz sound wave can give the information of the entire, entire uh, respiratory system. So 20 hertz is basically for the proximal airways, 5 hertz for the entire airways and all the frequencies between 5 to 20 hertz, that is between 5 to 20 hertz if we take R5 minus R20, then what we get is, is the what is there in this peripheral airways. This is the part where we do not find if changes occurs, nothing will get reflected in the spirometry except we have a very soft of parameter in spirometer is MEF 25 to 75 but still that is not a very standardized or robust parameter in the spirometry. So now what parameters we measure in the oscillometry as the most important thing to under understand. As I have said the main parameter is the impedance or we call it the total airway resistance. Now, now see what this impedance is made up of. As I have said, the impedance has two sub-components. One is a resistance, which is, is actually a shown as R, and another is the reactance, which is depicted as X. So when we say R, R, S, it's actually the respiratory system resistance. When we say X, R, S, that is the respiratory system reactants. So these are the two main parameters we measure in an in a oscillometry. Now resistance I have said, resistance is very easy to understand. When there is a flow, so through a tube of any pressure wave, the impediment it actually faces while flowing is the resistance. And we know the resistance ends is, is is wow which is related to the radius of airways, it is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius. So smaller the airways, the higher goes as the resistance. So if it, if it gets constricted, the airway resistance goes up. So as we know that in asthmatics, when the airway caliber decreases, resistance increases. So the airflow impediment increases, we get the Vs and we get the symptoms when the patients comes to us. So, thing is that in the adults, the cross-section or area of the smaller airway is huge. So, in the peripheral airways, there has to be more than 60 to 70 percent involvement of the peripheral airways to have somewhat significant impact on the total airway resistance. So, that means in adults, this is more or less a silent zone of the respiratory system and any changes in that part does not get reflected in the spirometry. But in children it's not the same. In children the cross-sectional area is much smaller, so resistance from the peripheral airways is quite high, so that means in children normally also the inter resistance would be higher because the smaller airways, so in children we can pick up the things earlier than adults, so the adult have a long incubation or a window period where we don't get much signs and symptoms, but in children it's not the same. So this is how we calculate that is the resistance again for the for total airway resistance. We just divide into two main fractions: the resistance at five hertz, which is actually the total airway resistance, resistance at 20 hertz, which is the larger airway resistance, and resistance five minus R20 which is the only the small airway resistance. So as I have said that in a, an adult, uh, since in the peripheral airways constitutes very little of the total airway resistance, so in healthy adults, resistance at R5 and resistance R20 are more or less same because this part constitutes very little to the total airway resistance in a healthy adult. Okay. If there is a large airway obstruction, say obstruction in the large or the central airways, 
So what will happen is that the wave which is traversing the entire length of the airways, in that also resistance will increase because it has gone through that larger airways and the wave which has only traversed the larger airway, the resistance will increase. So a large area obstruction, both the R5 and the R20, both these parameters will rise independent of frequency. Whatever be the frequency we throw inside the lungs, when it comes back, the resistance parameters are increased. But what happens in the small or the peripheral airway obstruction? In the small or the peripheral airway obstruction, the R5 wave, which has gone deep inside the lungs to the lung peripheries and has come back, so in the resistive wave parameters will increase. But the wave which has not gone that deep and only gone till the larger airways, when it comes back, its resistance will remain unchanged. Why? Because it has not traversed that area where the disease is. So in case of the small or the peripheral airway obstruction, resistance at 5 hertz is increased, or the resistance at 20 hertz does not increase, which we call a frequency dependence change in the resistance. So a frequency dependent change in the resistance is basically a characteristic of the small or the peripheral airway resistances. And if there's a total airway obstruction, both the large and small, then everything in increases. And also there is no frequency dependent change. In small children, we have seen that the resistance is actually quite high than the adults because the peripheral airway also constitutes significantly to the airway resistance in children and it gets more worse in any disease state. So this is how we show that in the x-axis, there's a frequencies, in the y-axis is the resistances. So we can see that in the resistance at 5 hertz, it is high, okay? And then as we move forward, the resistance at 20 hertz, it is less. So this frequency dependence of resistance is basically, this is characteristic of peripheral airway disease. This is a predicted line, normal line, where the resistance does not change much with the change in the frequencies, but whenever there is a peripheral airway disease, the resistance at lower frequencies goes up. So this is how the resistance curves looks like. So, so this is a normal curve. Resistance at five words slightly raised, but there's not much change in, in throughout the resistances. Slope remains more or less near to zero. And if there is a proximal airway obstruction here, you find that the resistance, entire resistance has increased, but even there is no frequency dependence. So, so the resistance proximal airway also increased, resistance of the distal airway has also increased. Now what we find in the restrictive lung disease, restrictive lung disease does not cause any impediment to the air flow. So that means it remains the normal. So resistance parameter, is not a parameter to be used if you want to find out a restrictive lung disease through the oscillometry. Now, interestingly, what happens in distal obstruction, we can find the resistance of 5 hertz is increased. At 20 hertz, it's less. There is a frequency dependence of the resistance. And this is this type of curve we find in the peripheral air obstruction. So this is normal. This restrictive lung disease is also normal. Proximal obstruction, entire thing is flat but goes up. And distal obstruction, it is basically a frequency dependence of the resistance pa parameter. So this is what is depicted in these two curves. Now comes a bit difficult uh, thing to understand, that is the reactance. Now the reactance is also called imaginary part. These are just semantics. So we need not uh, worry much about it. But what it measures, we should understand this, okay? Now this reactance is basically made of, again, two subparts. One is an inertance and another is a capacitance. So it is the addition of the inertance and the capacitance which gives reactance. Now what is an inertance? Now if we understand that anything, any object which has a mass will have an inertia. So if we try to push that mass, there will be an inertive force which will be actually resisting that object to move from its place. So similarly what happens in the column of air, 
which is inside the airways, the molecules and atoms which is there inside, they also have a very negligible mass inside. Okay. So if there is a pressure wave which is trying to push away that at column of the air inside the smaller airways, it will impede because it will it won't like to be move, moved away from that. Like like if I'm sitting and somebody's trying to push me and so I would impede that I don't want to leave that place. Anyway, this inertia is a characteristic of all the matter in the universe. So what happens is that because of the inherent inertia or the mass, the obstruction or the impediment and that it actually causes to the flow of the air is what is called inertance. So you can just understand the how vanishingly small this is, uh, uh, this actually parameter would be when we talk about the inertia of the oxygen, carbon dioxide and all those things in the airways. So this machine is so sensitive that it is actually measuring all these things. So it is extremely sensitive device. So this is what is called inertance. Now what is capacitance? The capacitance is, say a fluid, say an air or a, or a means pressure wave is flowing through an elastic tube. If it flows through an elastic tube, it is going to offer a pressure all around it. So that means if there is an elastic tube and there is a fluid which is flowing through it, it is going to apply a pressure on all the sides and try to expand it. Now, due to the elasticity of the tissues around it, if it gets expanded, it is again going to come back to its original level, original place. When it comes back to its original place, it is going to compress the air uh, or, the, or the means uh, air inside the tube. This compression of the air inside the tube, which has occurred because of this pressure has actually extended it and it has come back, is going to have an impediment again on the flow of that pressure wave. So this is what is called a capacitance or a capacitative uh, resistance. So this is also called, this is similar to the uh, like, uh, elasticity of the tissue also called elastance, but this is the concept. So that means reactance is a parameter which is actually been formed by addition of two very small sub-parameters. One is the inertance, which is basically the impediment provided by the mass or the inertia of the air inside the tube. And another is a capacitance, which is basically an impediment which is offered because of the elastic compression of the tissue surrounding that tube. So actually, they are both added together. By convention, this capacitance is taken as a negative. Okay, why? Because it is by convention. So X or the reactance comes out to be I minus your this is the capacitive value. And how do we measure the, the capacitance? Ca capacitance is basically it is measured as 1 divided by omega is, is actually, it is a constant which is, depends upon the frequency. It's 1 by capacitance. So you can see that if the capacitive force increases, now this is, so what any capacitive force will increase if the tissue elasticity decreases. Okay, so more force it, it will offer. So then what will happen is the entire, this value will then decrease because C is in the denominator and this entire value if it is decreased since it is this I minus this value so that means the reactance is again going to increase. So what we find is that both this capacitance and the inertance is going to have a major impact on the flow of the airway of the air which is generated by the sound wave. So if the capacitance decreases, this increases, X becomes more negative since it is after uh, the is minus some, is I minus something. If the capacitance increases, the X becomes more positive. So X is usually reactance, is if we take in the smaller airways. Now what happens is that in the smaller airways, the inertance or the air inside the smaller airways is very, very less. Okay, so almost nearing to zero. 
So this more air in the larger airways, volume of air is more. In each individual smaller airways, volume of air is extremely less. So that's, we are interested in the tissues, in the airways. So basically, when we are taking this parameter that is X, taking X at larger frequency, that is 20 hertz, it means nothing because 20 hertz X is basically the information which is giving the, for the inertive force of the air column in the airways. So always we take at this is the X at the lower frequencies which will give the information of what is happening there deep inside the airways. So if you see that since resistance we measure both the R at 5 hertz, R at 20 hertz, R 5 minus 20 hertz but for the reactants we are only interested in what is there in the reactants at 5 hertz. And interestingly if we see as the frequencies increases the reactance is also increases because all these capacitative and inertive forces goes on changing. So in the smaller airways it is mainly the capacitative force so the reactance is negative and since the inertive force is vanishingly small it is mainly a negative which is given by the capacitative force. As we move up it is basically the inertive force which becomes dominant and the reactance also becomes positive. So there may be some intermediate at frequencies where both the capacitative force and the inertive force are equal. So that is the frequency which is called the resonant frequency where the entire si impedance of the respiratory system is given by the, react uh, is the resistance only since the reactance is zero. And the significance of F rest will come. So this is just the reactance curve. So if you see the reactance, that means it is a curve of, say, this is a reactance of five words. We don't take reactance at the multiple uh, frequencies, okay. So now these are the frequencies which is there and as the frequencies are increasing the reactance curve increases. This is a normal reactance curve. In a disease state there is always a shift to the left, uh, sorry, shift to the right of, of the curve. So that means when in, whenever there is a disease there is always this reactance curve shifts to the right. So shifting to the right of the reactance curve is an indication of a disease. Now what happens when they shift it to the right? Then this, see the, uh, this is the resonant frequency. Resonant frequency also increases. So that means any disease state causes a rise in the resonant frequencies or the rise in the F res. Now we come to the another very sensitive parameter that is AX. AX is the integrated reactance. So mainly we have the resistance, we have the reactance, we have the resonant frequency and we have the integrated reactants. These are the four main parameters we see in the oscillometry. In the resistance, we have resistance 5 hertz, 20 hertz, 5 minus 20, and in reactance at X5, we had X5 total, we have, have your F rest and we have the AX or the integrated reactants. Integrated reactants is actually it's the area. It is the area of the reactants curve, which is the integration of all the frequencies from the 5 hertz to the F rest. And so this is also called a Goldman triangle, but this, this reactance area is very, very sensitive indicator of any disease because what we know as of now, in any disease state, the parameters which first changes is the AX or the integrated reactance and it has its own applications in the post lung transplant and patients and, and in, in a few other conditions. So this is again the same curve, reactance curve, F rest, this blue is the AX or the integrated reactance and this is the reactance. Okay. So resonant frequency and the AX we just talked about. Now see what happens in a normal airway. So this is the air goes inside, this is the alveoli which is getting distended and, and then again the air comes back. So elasticity is normal, that means capacitance is normal, reactance is normal. AX is normal. In case of fibrosis, what happens? The fibrosis, th this is the fibrose lung. Air is not able to enter very well over there. It goes into the, is a good alveoli nearby. So what happens is that elasticity is more in the bad alveoli. So the capacitance is less. The reactance is more negative. And the AX becomes more. In case of the hyperinflated lung, what happens is that this is a hyperinflated uh, lung where the alveoli, the alveolar 
uh, uh, this is damaged the alveolar walls and we have big alveoli which is compressing upon the nearby good alveoli. So the elasticity in the bad alveoli is less but it is compressing on the normal alveoli also and this compression it reduces as it has an impact on the peripheral airway at parameters. So what happens is that there is obstruction to the signals coming from here since this is an obstructed part. So capacitance is less of the healthy individual, reactance becomes again more negative and the, and the integrated reactance is also more. So this is how it happens, the reactance, basic reactance curves in various disease state. This is the normal. If there is a distal obstruction, again it is going to be shifted towards the right. If there is a proximal obstruction, not much changes happens, it remains the same. So we are not interested in that. And in the restrictive lung disease, again it has shifted towards the right and looks exactly similar to what we see in case of the distal obstruction. So that means again the reactance parameters, whole breath reactance parameters does not differentiate between a restrictive or an obstructive disease process. But it can say yes, the part is diseased. We have, uh, then we need to do some secondary tests, the parameters which can differentiate be between them. So this is in nutshell what happens in the FOT or in IOS. In the peripheral airway path uh, means pathophysiology, pathology, R5 is very much high. R20 may be normal, may be slightly raised. R5 minus 20 is raised and there is, there is a freak and the reactance is more negative. FS is raised, AX is raised. So, and there is a peripheral and there is a frequency dependence on the resistance. In the proximal airway obstruction, entire resistance goes up. So, but R5 minus R20 will remain normal since this is in peripheral airways is normal. Reactive X5 would be normal because X5 is basically gives information about or uh, means we are uh, means our smaller air, air parameters. F rays also remains normal and the reactance curves normal, but the proximal obstruction, the resistance curves goes up. In the restrictive lung disease, again the resistance parameters all remains normal, but there is a change in the reactance pa parameters. The reactance curve moves to the right and a X5 becomes more negative, F rays is increased, AX is increased. So basically we have to integrate everything when we have to deduce what is there in the test. So uh, this is uh, what is there, always we remember that at times when it happens that when and the entire reactants is in very diseased tests like it's a pre and the post bronchodilator study when we do it. So this is what is a pre bronchodilator study and here uh, it is, uh, this is the obstruction so everything is moved to the right when there is a bronchodilation occurs then it comes back to the to the normal so in this state the ax is decreased but the decrease in the ax is usually not all the time of the, of the same degree to that of the x5 so uh, we just have to remember two three things and that is whenever we are measuring this reactance and resistance parameters in the airways we need to have have an Indian predicted equations for this parameter because until and unless we have an our own predicted equations, we won't know what is normal and what is abnormal. If you don't have the parameters, we can say the trend. If we measure the parameters over a period of time for a single individual, we can say that whether it's increasing or decreasing or whatever it is, but a single measurement will carry less meaning and we won't be able to deduce anything from that if we do not have any normal parameters to control with it, as we have seen in case of the spirometry. As of now, for, for the Indian population, we have actually three regression equations. One is for the children, which was published in the Lung India by, by Dr. Neeraj, uh, Dr. Neeraj Gupta from Gangaram, uh, published, that's for the children. For uh, the adults, we have a publication by Dr. Sajal Day, published in, again in Lung, Lung India in 2020. And this is for where they use a pseudo-random noise oscillation, that is the PRN. That is for the FOT, or we also call the AOS. For the impulse oscillometer, we have our own regression equation by our group, and we published in the IJTLD, 
that is the impulse oscillometry regression equation for adults, for Indian adults. We did it for Eastern Indian adults. Now, uh, we don't know whether for the Western Indian adults or Northern or Southern India it's different or not. For Eastern Indian adults, we have in the oscillometry. Now, what are the prerequisite for the test? Very less. It has to be done uh, in a sitting position. Their uh, legs should be uncrossed, nose clip should be there so that the, all the flow is occurring through the mouth and mouthpiece at a comfortable height and the tight seal between the mouthpiece and the lips and, and the cheek should be held firmly so that the sound waves do not dissipate in the cheeks. And then we take minimum three readings to be taken and three times the test is repeated and, and it is age and height dependent match values are taken. So this is how a child is performing this oscillometry and always remember to do a calibration of the machine is important as we do in spirometry we have we have calibration checks for the oscillometry even and we should understand and that the quality of the reading it should be acceptable we have acceptable para parameters and which, which the machine does on its own so it only selects the three acceptable readings from um, what is being done it's a tidal breath only the tidal breathing is done so there is no forced maneuver Okay, so always remember a few common mistakes is that poorly, poor cheek support, use of some bacterial filters can actually cause a more impediment, but we have to use it. We have no other option for that. Improper tongue position, like tongue coming in, in between the airflow can impede the, the airflow. And if there's air leaks or uh, there is any other problems, this can cause. These are the usually the common things. This algorithm was developed after by uh, this uh, King group. So this is a simple algorithm which they published. It says the same thing which I have said, the initial calibration check, then, then the patient should be positioned properly. Then we see the validity criteria is met or not, but in the recent machines, they have already, they say whether this reading is acceptable or not after checking the validity cri criteria. The validity criteria previously, we used to take the coherence, that is the difference in the pressure and flow between what is the waves being sent and what is being reflected. And we say the coherence should be 0.9 at, at 5 hertz. This is a study by Neeraj Gupta and this is our study, the Sajal Day study, I put it in somewhere but I think missed it. So this is a very common type we usually depict it, depict it in form of the values and as I have said that don't go after the person predicted once because you do not know what is the predicted for our population. Just see what is the predicted, what is, what is the pre, that is what is the actual values and then over a the period of time see what is the increase and decreasing. If you are using the Indian predicted equation is there in the machine because most of the machines uses the Oost-Vents equation which is not our equation. For the AOS it's better to use the Sajal Day's equation for, for the, uh, for, uh, for means adults and for impulse oscillometry you should use our equation and for adults. And so depending upon that, but we can see, see this, this, is the, uh, this is actually what is there, the reactance, this is the resonant frequencies, we have normal values for, for it, and we just check, like the resonant frequency is 6 to 12 hertz, anything more than 12 hertz is abnormal, and uh, this is total, this reactance 0 0.33, it should be more, it's, it's high, and this is the thing we see, I think we can discuss this in the workshop. These are the various uh, things we had, and this is just small example. I will just uh, talk about it and we end this session. So this is what we see, a typical airflow oscillometry. As I've said that airflow oscillometry uses the pseudo-random noise. And this is basically a curve which is not changing with your frequencies. So which curve is this? Resistance curve. And this is the curve which is changing with frequencies. So what curve is it? The reactance curve. So resistance curve we see in this patient is more or less flat. So that means at least we know there is no peripheral obstruction. It is normal. So this is normal. Reactance curve is slightly shifted to the right. This type of slight variation we usually get and how we should interpret it, it's still a matter of discussion depending upon the patient's history, symptomatology, patient's environment, where the patient is staying, whether city dwellers or rural areas, or city with a very poor air quality index or thing, things like that. And these are the various parameters we see and then we inter interpret it. So this is how I try to uh, well, explain that what is airwave oscillometry, how we can incorporate it in our practice and use it 
to get some information for our patients which is not possible through a routine testing like the spirometry. So basically the greatest advantage is to be able to monitor the course of disease. I have said in lung transplant patients we can do serial oscillometries to see how it is changing and mainly the patients who cannot perform it and basically in relation to COPD, asthma, ILD, obstetric sleep apnea, other conditions, its use has come. So it is a potential useful tool and I think we all should incorporate it. Now since we have this machine in our hand, only if we all come and incorporate it and give your data and do it, it more and more on the normal individuals, you will understand what is the normal values for our population and it can provide objectivity during major management because patient cannot actually actually falsify their record because it's not depend upon the forced maneuver. So it is normal tidal breathing. So whatever you get is the actual. They cannot be manipulated, the results, which is very important. And so it's easy to use PFT, more sensitive for peripheral airway disease. Bronchotoli reversibility also can be checked in this, safe in COVID era because since you are not doing a forced expiratory maneuver, there's less chances of producing aerosols. So adults, still now it's a supplement to spirometry. In children, it might replace spirometry once we get all the predicted equations in hand. So it could be a future uh, lung, lung function testing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moitra. Uh, it is something very new for us. And me as a pediatrician would like to know what is the youngest age when you can do it? See, actually it can be done above two years of age. Okay. Because we only have to fit in in the mask and the child is taking the normal breath. Even in few studies they have done to ages as low as one year also. But above two years on age it can be very easy. Any questions from the audience please? I could give some sort of idea what we were like to look at. So these two babies I have done below two years in Ranchi, but yes, as per the existing literature, currently accepted above two years age. Under five, between two to five, we are regularly doing it even at Ranchi. Because only the one thing is there that if we go much below the younger age groups, what happens is that there the airways are still developing. And in the developing airways, what happens is that there is a normal change in the tissue's resistive properties, mainly, mainly the reactive properties. So in the reactance pa parameters, what we usually get at very young children, it could be a normal physiological change rather than depicting a disease state. So there comes the importance of, but if you're doing it uh, serially on that particular child over a period of time to see the trend, but that trend could be we have to differentiate between normal physiological developmental change or a pathological change, which is still not available. And there comes the drawback of having a test of a very high sensitivity. Because if a test of a very high sensitivity, if you have, you tend to pick up something which is called false positive. So false positivity rate goes up. And so the false positivity rate of in this, by this machine is quite high up in very young children. So which actually demerits its use to a very, very young children, but maybe with, with the newer generations of machines which is coming, coming up, and with the intra breath variations, maybe it might get changed, overcome in the, in the, in the years to come, maybe. Uh, spirometry, exactly. if you combine the both, so I think the result will be better in that Usually way. in adults, we combine the both, as I've said, that in adults, it, this test is basically done as, is, as a supplement to the spirometry as of now, because once we have the spirometry results, and then we have the impulse oscillometry results, and then we can formulate it like, like what is being given by the two. But maybe with time to come with a very good or predicted equations as we generate for our population, this test might replace the spirometry in the years to come. But as of now, it's still a supplement to the spirometry, yes. 
it can be. As I've said, this test can be done even on ventilated patients. Patients of fine position can, can be done. Because the patient does nothing. The patient is only taking in and, and giving out breath. The pressure waves are sent and it, is, it, comes, it comes back. Like in fact, uh, the, the, one of the publication which was there from, I think, the Neeraj Gupta's group, they had done it on the children admitted in their ICUs. Okay. So that is, I think they have it another publication where they have shown the use of, of the oscillometry in the admitted children. See, basically, in the pre-operative assessment, we do it for two main reasons. One is, if you are doing any intrathoracic surgeries, we need to know that what will be the predicted post-operative lung function which will be there. And for the extra thoracic, or if you're not doing the lung, uh, lung resections for any other surgeries, the thoracic, extra thoracic, we want to know what will be the perioperative and post-operative morbidity from, from that surgery. So in this, we have very characteristic a way or a guideline which is given on the, base, on the basis of the spirometry and also the DLCO, which are much robust to predict the perioperative and immediate post-operative complications of a surgery. What we do not have as of now of the oscillometry is that the guidelines or the cutoff values at which there will be an increased chances of the post-operative complications. So as of now, this cannot be done, but as I have said that this is a growing a tool which we have, we ourselves need to build on it so that its utility increases. It has an immense potential. This has an immense potential. The reactance parameter tells many things about the lungs. But we need to understand that this many big story that, he, that the, this, this instrument is telling us that how much it is clinically relevant and how much we need not pay attention to. So that we only know if we use it more in our practice, we develop the equations and we see it in various spectrum. So as of now, in for the preoperative assessment of the lung function, this test is not used as of now. How is, sir, I am still not able to get it. How is IUS useful in restrictive lung disorders? And is there any criteria for uh, uh, means, uh, grading the severity of obstruction based on IUS? There is, a, there is a criteria. I think I just brushed through the slide. Do you want me to go back there? Okay. And, and sir, how is it back. useful in restrictive lung restrictive disorders? See, restrictive lung, lung disease you see oh. that if you have seen my a uh, that slide where I have shown the flow chart very easy flow chart for all for all of us to understand that the resistance parameters remain same in case of either it is an obstructive or a restrictive disease right but the reactance pa parameters it increases the shift of the reactance curve to the right okay so means when you combine both the resistance and the reactance para parameter, you find the resistance parameter is all and all is normal. That means either it could be normal or it could be some restrictive disease in the smaller, smaller tissues, smaller airways. So when we have the reactance curve, you can find it out. Now more advancement has been done on that. Advancement is that what I have shown is all parameters are whole breath parameters. That means all throughout the inspiration and expiration what is happening, the entire integrated reactances is given as one number, okay. But it can be even dissected to the intra breath, that is the inspiratory and the expiratory parameters, which we also call the inspiratory values, expiratory values, the win vex we call it. So the win vex is one of the newer parameters or second generation parameters which actually shows a difference in the restrictive airway diseases. Third thing, there's a third generation parameters also. Third generation parameters is when we actually plot the graph of the, of the obstructive restrictive whichever disease, okay, on the other three axes. Here I have shown the two axes. That is, the one is the resistance, another is resistance or reactance, whatever it is, in the, in the x-axis. Uh, sorry, in the y-axis, in the x-axis it is the frequencies 
and another another axis where we have the area or the time so these are called the entropy parameters where it is shown that there is much changes in the normal airways and in the restrictive diseases but the entropy parameter changes a lot in the restrictive diseases in comparison to the normal airways entropy parameters also changes a lot in the copd also not much in asthma changes in severe asthma but it is entirely different the picture is entirely different sir as so, as as in spirometry we check fvc over 3 months or 6 months to know whether the disease status or uh, to assess the therapeutic response is there any parameter you can like show that that's what i am saying that this is a very sensitive test to pick up the temporal event if you don't have the predicted equation to know the temporal event this is a very sensitive test like if a patient had a lung transplant recently and we don't know whether the patient is developing the bronchiolitis or not as a immediate transplant rejection no, sir so, as uh, sir i'm uh, only i mean restricted to the restrictive, restrictive. lung diseases you, are, you, you want to know about which one sir the right the restrictive lung disease restrictive we, lung, uh, lung uh, disease is there any yes. parameter uh, to assess the restrictive therapy? lung lung disease the two main parameters you have to see one is the resonant frequency another is the integrated reactants if there is increase in the resonant frequencies over a period of time with an associated increase in the integrated reactants again over a period of time and that increases in the tune of say 20% to 40% more than that that means you can assess very early that whatever restrictive process is underlying it is deteriorating okay so these are two main important parameters these are the first generation parameters that is the fres and also the ax if you use it for the restricted lung disease and measure it serially you can do it much before that if these parameters are increasing especially the ax if it is increases you can show the disease is deteriorating under it i i would like to interrupt the session of dr mehta has been so informative that there can be many more questions i think the questions can be taken during lunch hour or during the uh, workshop session once again thank you very much dr mehta for for enlightening us about the oscillometry thank you very much sir i would like to request dr binod kumar singh sir to hand over the moment to dr sebal mehta sir I would like to request Dr. Samantha Sir to invite Dr. Devraj Jarsh Sir to share the next session. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, esteemed guests over here. Um, I would like to uh, essentially thank Dr. Nishit for organizing this wonderful sessions and uh, inviting us to participate in this. Um, I would like to introduce to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Devraj Jarsh. Uh, who will be uh, enlightening us over the topic uh, of uh, bronchial thermoplasty which is a new and upcoming uh, treatment modality for treatment of uh, uncontrolled asthma um, dr devraj jas is a dnb dm pulmonary medicine and has also done his mrcp and edrm he is now uh, working as a consultant in apollo glen eagles hospital kolkata and his area of expertise includes pulmonary critical care airway disease and interventional pulmonology he has got his all time highest marks and gold medal in dm examination in pulmonary and critical care in the history of pulmonary and critical care uh, medicine in india he has over 40 publications in index journals he has been selected for thematic poster presentation in ers annual congress 2013 He is the recipient of ERS Gold Sponsorship Award for ERS Annual Congress 2013 in Barcelona. He was the recipient of ERS Gold Sponsorship Award for ERS Annual Congress 2014. He went to Munich, Germany to present his paper. He was the recipient of ERS Sponsorship in ERS Annual Congress 2018 held in Paris. So he is a distinguished pulmonologist and uh, I invite him over 
to <coughs> enlighten us on the topic of bronchial thermoplasty. Over to you, sir. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thanks to the organizer for inviting me to come to the city of Rachi and deliver a talk on bronchial thermoplasty and its place in the severe asthma. Now, this is a tool which we started using just three to four months back. So, our experience is also very limited and I will share my experience of the, those two cases in which we performed the bronchial thermoplasty and the literature regarding the bronchial thermoplasty and also the how the mechanism it works and what should be the selection of the patient who will satisfy the criteria for bronchial thermoplasty. So, coming to the case number one, a 42 year old male who is a known asthmatic with had history of three acute asthma exacerbation leading to the history of hospitalization in last three years and use of repeated course of short steroid in every month in PFT FEV1 of 62 percent of the predicted value. So, here comes a patient who is a bread and butter for every pulmonologist a patient who is coming to the OPD with an history of repeated history of asthma exacerbation and with a history of relatively stable when he is coming to the OPD and is compelled to visit hospital or emergency at a short period of time. So now what to do in this patient and how to approach this patient. Now whenever a patient of uncontrolled asthma comes to your clinic, the most common thing as we are taught from our postgraduate days is to check the inhalational technique. Whether the inhalational technique is correct or not. Second, whether the diagnosis of asthma is correct or not. And third, another important, whether any associated aggravating factor present or not. And fourth, any associated comorbidity present or not. After ruling out all those things, if the still asthma remains uncontrolled, then only we will coin it as an uncontrolled asthma. So the approach again to summarize, check the inhalational technique, assess the compliance whether the patient is taking regularly or not, confirm the diagnosis of asthma, identify a particular aggravating factor which is present or not and treatment of the comorbidities. Now coming to the GINA guideline, I want to mention there is no specific mention of bronchial thermoplasty, the step 1, step 2, step 3, step 4, step 5. So probably in those patients in which it will fulfill the criteria, I will come later on. So this is a severe asthma treatment flowchart which has been taken from the Lancet as well as ERS. Here we can see we will classify as Dr. Dashgupta has already told a TH2 low and TH2 high. So in TH2 low variant where there is no significant role of the biologicals in those kind of severe asthmatic individual now what is the solution what to give. So in those kind of patient bronchial thermoplasty plays an important role. However bronchial thermoplasty has got no role with IgE or eosinophil that means it may be used also in allergic asthma however where there is role of the or where there is a scope of biologicals. There is no head to head trial between bronchial thermoplasty and the biologicals. So what we do it now coming to our case, so we check the technique of the inhalation, we confirm the diagnosis of asthma, we excluded the presence of other comorbidities. Now we check the serum Ig which came out to be 62 international unit per liter and there was absence of peripheral eosinophilia. So now what to do? We opted for bronchial thermoplasty and I think in this patient there is no other option rather than to go for bronchial thermoplasty if it is available. The most important thing which I will again emphasize, please exclude asthma mimickers before proceeding further. This is another case, case 2, a 35 year old female who is presented with breathlessness for one year, dry cough and wheeze on and off for six months, streaky hemoptysis three months back. And she was diagnosed as a case of asthma, evaluated for ABPA, subsequently given anti-tubercular therapy on high dose ICS and LABA and had an audible wheeze in the OPD. This is the chest x-ray of the patient and she is being treated for asthma on and off. Now in the CT scan you can see there is a big thing in the CT scan and when we did the bronchoscopy we find there is a big mass inside the trachea which is actually responsible for that monophonic wheeze. 
So even when the chest X-ray may seem relatively okay, in every asthmatic individual, when you are finding it difficult to control, nowadays when there is so many facility of doing a simple CT scan, so always exclude other diagnosis because other diagnosis which we often miss. And should again, so there should be a low threshold to perform CT scan thorax before performing or before proceeding for bronchial thermoplasty. So the questions I hope which you will be able to answer after my talk, what is bronchial thermoplasty, how is the treatment delivered, what are the mechanisms of bronchial thermoplasty, what is the approximate cost of the pay, pay treatment and how the bronchial thermoplasty work and what are the major studies of the bronchial thermoplasty, what were their major findings and more important than the major finding, what are the major limitations of that study what are the efficacy outcomes, safety profile and practical indication of bronchial thermoplasty. So to coming back how bronchial thermoplasty acts in asthmatic individuals there is enlargement in the size as well as enlargement in the number of the smooth muscles and smooth muscles are predominantly responsible for bronchoconstriction, hyperresponsiveness, inflammation, remodeling, interaction with the epithelium. So, Bronchial thermoplasty is a non-pharmacological treatment which although is predominantly acting on the smooth muscle, it also has many other mechanism of actions like it disrupt the actin-myosin interaction, denaturation of the motor protein, reduction in the thickness of the reticular basement membrane, structural effect on the neuroendocrine epithelial cell, effect on the bronchial nerve ending. Uh, what is the bronchial thermoplasty and what are the prerequisites prior to doing the bronchial thermoplasty? A bronchial thermoplasty only requires, mean, whoever is comfortable in doing the flexible bronchoscopy, anyone can perform bronchial thermoplasty. It is only the machine which is expensive and it is the catheter more than the machine which is more expensive which makes this procedure not so available or not so opportunistic or not so attractive. So it consists of two things, one is the controller which is the controller or the machine which is an easily portable machine and second one is the catheter which is more important than that controller machine because any company or actually the, a single company is doing the bronchial thermoplasty boston. So they used to supply the controller to anyone if you have the patient of the bronchial thermoplasty, only thing is regarding the catheter. So catheter, one catheter ideally should be used for a single setting but because of the cost constraint we used to use the one catheter for three money settings because any patient for bronchial thermoplasty will require three settings. So we money tend to use the single catheter for the three settings. Uh, from our experience while we are doing the last setting the fires are not that good because it gets exhausted. So because one catheter can do a maximum number of actuation and there will be some kind of misfires also. So you need to uh, while we did our second case we did it reasonably good because at that time we had experience of how to uh, how many actuation because when we go inside you tend to use too many actuations in the first two settings. So you should leave some for the third setting as well because you will not have that luxury to use multiple catheters for multiple settings. Coming to the cost of the treatment, the catheter will cost you around 1.5 to 1.6 lakh and the machine will cost you 50 lakhs. Approximately uh, if you calculate the entire cost it will cost you around 3.5 to 4 lakhs for the entire treatment if you include everything. Now bronchial thermoplasty, if you go to this video, how does the bronchial thermoplasty work? This is the bronchoscope uh, which we tend to include. First, I need to emphasize that with normal bronchoscope, you cannot do bronchial thermoplasty. You require an ultra-thin bronchoscope which is nowadays available by Olympus or pediatric bronchoscope for doing the bronchial thermoplasty through which the catheter is passed. There are certain marks or there are certain guide wires which are part indicating of where to put. Now if you deliver this actuation then you tend to withdraw this catheter to one mark then you again deliver one actuation then you again withdraw this catheter and then you again deliver another actuation. By this way you will deliver the actuation and you come from distal to proximal aspect. So you will start distally and then you will come proximally and you then deliver actuation by going to each and every stations. 
So it is completed in three outpatient procedure. In the first setting, we tend to select the right lower lobe. In the second setting, we tend to select the left lower lobe. In the third setting, we tend to select both upper lobes. Uh, usually in every setting, we used to deliver around uh, in the first setting or second setting or third setting around 80 to 90. But the problem is that whenever you use the ultra thin bronchoscope, you just go inside the subsegmental bronchus, you will go inside and inside. You can realize how many, which we have read in our books or that number of generations of the airway, you will realize the number of generations. So there comes the most important thing that you should not enter into the same generation because you will not be able to identify. So there should be a particular person who will do the bronchial mapping. And middle lobe is usually not targeted because of the fear of the middle lobe syndrome. However, it is controversial. Many of the pulmonologists are also opinion that we should target the middle lobe as well. Uh, there is a proverb when Russia targeted the Ukraine in the uh, civil war or in the war. So everyone thought that the war would be over by around two weeks or three weeks. So Ukrainians did many tricks. One of the tricks which I clicked from any of the newspaper that they removed all the, in the uh, roads or in all the highways, they removed all those maps to go, how to know where to go and where not to go. So they removed and in some of the cases, they intentionally put wrong hoardings. So a good plan is like a road map. Similarly, in bronchial thermoplasty, the most important person is of an assistant who will draw the bronchial mapping, that in which subsegment you are going. So, and you need to have a numerical value of those th mapping that in which of the areas not to go and which of the areas to go. Because otherwise in a single sub-segment you will exhaust all the actuations. So someone should be there for bronchial mapping. Now how does the bronchial thermoplasty I already told the actuation is for 65 degrees Celsius for 10 seconds at each of the treatment site. Coming to the procedure. So this is the uh, another uh, video uh, to uh, more or less same. So I will not go. I will show you another video. So is the bronchial therm so is the bronchial thermoplasty for the small airway obstruction as well? Uh, it, this is a misconception that uh, in bronchial thermoplasty we will not be able to reach the small airways because the small airways it will not be able to reach the airway of less than three millimeter diameter. So bronchial thermoplasty is also for the larger airways. There is a misconception that it targets the small airway. It does not target the small airway, nor does it has any impact on the distal airway resistance and inflammation. This is a normal activation, how we did in our patient. So we are going inside, uh, this is the uh, catheter which we um, mane showed to you and we also sometimes uh, used to take the help of the CR to see where exactly we are heading but you do not require CRs all the times. So we put the catheter, there are number of markings you can see, so the catheter should be out with the maximum number of markings out. Then we will gradually withdraw by delivering each and every actuation and then we will remove the catheter one by one step. You can see, then we are withdrawing this catheter gradually. We will deliver one actuation, then again we will withdraw. And then uh, when the final uh, mark is out, then you will be able to see those big things and then we will deliver the final actuation. Now sometimes the things are not that easy. In asthmatic individual, we, what we heard about Kurtzman spiral or all those things, in some of the individuals, we found those things in the uh, subsegmental airway, like the, those mucus plug like things. And whenever there is that kind of mucus, the, the thermoplasty, it will not fire. 
it will not fire any part, even a small bit of mucus even if it is present that uh, thermoplasty LAR catheter will not be able to fire. So we should be very careful and there is a also good thing about the machine is that uh, if the if it is not in alignment with the wall it will never fire so you need not to worry regarding that whether you are placing it correctly or not if you, you haven't placed it correctly it will not fire and the machine will show automatically on the screen that it is not delivering now regarding the guideline there is an also ics guideline for bronchial thermoplasty for severe asthmatic individual so what are the inclusion criteria and what are the exclusion criteria? Inclusion criteria, any severe asthma individual, which I already told you, according to any guideline, age of 18 to 65 years of age, pre-bronchodilator FEV1 greater than 60 percent, oral prednisolone dose less than 10 milligram per day, stable asthma maintenance medication for four weeks, uh, and the, another important thing is that patient if more than the inclusion criteria I will emphasize more on the exclusion criteria in the exclusion criteria patient should not have any kind of exacerbation within at least three months and oral prednisolone dose those who are using greater than 10 milligram per day and those who have the pre bronchodilator FEV1 of less than 60 percent do not satisfy the criteria of bronchial thermoplasty so there lies the problem in your clinical practice, those patients who have uncontrolled asthma, most of them will have an FEV1 of less than 60 percent. So in reality, very few patients or very few small subsets of patients will classify the criteria of bronchial thermoplasty. So you may have a question, if we do those bronchial thermoplasty on those patients who have severe asthmatic and who have FEV1 less than 60 percent of predicted, what will be the benefit? there will not be any kind of harm but the benefit is questionable and it is more questionable because all the studies are mostly sponsored by the single company which is manufacturing it. Now regarding the literature which is available regarding the bronchial thermoplasty, the, there are mainly four articles which were available regarding the bronchial thermoplasty. The first one is the air trial. The second one is the research trial. The third one, the most important pioneer one, is the ER2 trial. And then comes the post-market surveillance, that is the PASS trial. So the first trial, ER trial, which was performed uh, in a patients of uh, uncontrolled asthma, the control group, the, there was the, the control group did not receive any kind of treatment. So there was a fallacy in that trial. What I am a patient, I know that I am receiving a treatment and there is a control group who, who is not receiving any kind of treatment. So to overcome the fallacy of those first two trials, there comes the concept of sham control. That in that control group, they are also de receiving the energy, but that is not the bronchial thermoplasty energy, that is a placebo energy. So the first two trials like AR and the research trial has the most uh, uh, limitation or the major limitation is that they do not have anything called as sham control in the control group. In the AR, con AR study or AR trial, the number of the severe exacerbation, it doesn't have any kind of beneficial effect. The only beneficial effect it does have is the percentage of the symptom free dress. So the air trial doesn't advocate the use of bronchial thermoplasty for reducing the exacerbation. Then comes the RISA trial in which the, it more or less reciprocated the result of the air trial. The third one is the most important trial is the air 2 trial regarding the effectiveness and safety of bronchial thermoplasty in the treatment of the severe asthma. Uh, here the asthma quality life questionnaire improved by 1.35 in the bronchial thermoplasty group and the difference uh, in the 1.16 in the sham group and the most benefit occurred in those individuals who have an AQ-LQ score of greater than 0.5. So more expectedly those who have more uncontrolled asthma benefited more by the bronchial thermoplasty. And regarding the secondary outcomes also, the number of the emergency visit, number of the severe exacerbation, number of hospitalization, all got reduced significantly. 
long term efficacy and safety is the year 2 extension study where they are followed up for the 5 years because you cannot say by your experience of 3 months whether it will be beneficial for the patient. You need to have a surveillance for 3, 5, 10 years to see whether the short term benefit lasts on a long term basis or not or whether it should be repeated on a successive interval or not. So there comes the year 2 extension study. So it uh, followed up all the patients for 5 years and they followed, they found out that proportion of the subject with severe exacerbation reduced by an average of 44 percent over 5 years and the proportion of subject with ear visits reduced by an average of 78 percent over 5 years. PAS2 study is the mo uh, most important real world clinical trial which evaluated bronchial thermoplasty in severe persistent asthma. Uh, this found that in PAS2 study, the beneficial effect lasted up to 3 years. So even up to 3 years, the hospitalization, emergency visits, exacerbation, the numbers were significantly less compared to those which were 1 year prior to bronchial thermoplasty. And the, this is the latest one which have been f published in the chest uh, that this effect lasted for 5 years. So regarding now the safety of the bronchial thermoplasty, the only a short term increase in the morbidity uh, in both of the patients in whom we performed none of expe them experienced any kind of adverse effect and even if the uh, exacerbation occurs it usually responds within a single day with the use of the steroid and if, by, if you treat on an outpatient visit they usually resolve with a standard therapy within a week. This is a BT10 plus study regarding the safety and effectiveness of bronchial thermoplasty after 10 years in patient of persistent asthma and they also found that the effect lasted even up to 10 years. Now the question is that would my steroid dependent patient with asthma will benefit from bronchial thermoplasty? The question is that we do not have any randomized clinical trial evidence to show whether it works in patients who are chronically dependent on oral corticosteroid. Only future trials will be able to throw light on this. And any of my patient who has a pre-bronchodilator FEV1 value of less than 60 percent, in those individuals also, we do not have any sham controlled evidence trial, but there is a trial which have just been launched right now. Uh, and which will be uh, done in at least uh, 60 to 70 settings to see whether it will work on the severe asthma who have airflow limitation as well. And whether it will be efficacious in patients with elevated eosinophils or high FENO or high Ig level, we do not have any information but probably they will be useful. And regarding the head to head trial of bronchial thermoplasty versus biologicals, it is also not available. Uh, what does GINA 2022 say? It says that it is a potential treatment option at a step 5 in some of the countries for adult patient in whom the asthma remains uncontrolled despite optimized therapeutic regimens and referral to an asthma specialty center. To conclude, I will say first exhaust all your options. It is not the first possible treatment, even it is not the last possible treatment. It is to be performed only at the expert centers with continued clearful data collection. Selection of the patient is the most important part in the procedure. No head to head trial is available regarding the biologicals versus bronchial thermoplasty. Caution, it should be used carefully in patient with FEV1 of less than 60 percent of predicted. Experienced centers may use lower cutoff like Yashoda Hyderabad is doing even in patients of FEV1 of less than 50 percent. Uh, able to undergo bronchoscopy safely, patient with persistent asthma symptoms while currently on biologicals also should be considered to undergo uh, or alternatively the biological therapy does not preclude the treatment of bronchial thermoplasty, it is relatively safe. To conclude, the future is completely open and we are writing it moment to moment and we will change also. But also we should not use it indiscriminately and people many a times use their knowledge for their convenience and this is for misusing of knowledge that we should not misuse our knowledge. Thank you very much.
Thank Dr. Devraj Jass. You have Thank nicely you. delivered and uh, shared your experience with the very uh, novel and uh, uh, latest and newer things in the interventional pulmonology, the bronchial thermoplasty. Um, I think there should be um, some questions from the audience. And if you, in the further uh, understanding, you can uh, do it in the lunch hour, but a few questions we can allow. No, it doesn't. Uh, it is. It acts on the smooth muscle. It uh, uh, although it has an effect on the bronchial mucous membrane, but it predominantly acts on the smooth muscle. And regarding the your question regarding mane, the mechanism also, how we are delivering the energy, uh, we touch the bronchial walls. You know, but when we are go entering into the submucosal, so it will affect the airway mucous membrane also. No doubt in that fact. What is the procedure time? The procedure time is average 45 minutes to one hour. Because it depends on how many actuation you will deliver and with more and more expertise, the procedure time will shorten. In the first uh, session, in the first patient, we took almost one and half hour. Because you need your technician also should be uh, expertise your team should know the bronchial mapping. Actually, bronchial mapping takes a lot of time because you will have 100 sub-segments inside. When you go inside, you will just, with an ultra-thin, which Olympus nowadays have launched, actually many of them are opinion of using the pediatric bronchoscope because in pediatric bronchoscope, you will not get too, many, too much confused. The ultra-thin has the advantage, but it has the disadvantage that you will go inside in and in. So it is very difficult to find out in which area you are actually delivering the energy. You will repeatedly go probably in the same seg sub-segment. Yes, you can use fluoroscope. We also use fluoroscope. Mm -hmm. Fluoroscope is only for to see how to how what extent you are going. But fluoroscope will not help you to identify in which sub-segment you are entering. Uh, uh, this is a very controversial question. Uh, so this is why they followed up those patients for 5 to 10 years. Now there is also a controversy whether it should be repeated, whether it should be repeated at an interval of 5 years, 10 years, 15 years. So more and more studies will only be able to throw light on this. Debraj, an excellent uh, presentation, especially the videos when they work. Uh, so my question to you would be that uh, how do you exactly go about selecting your patients? Selection. Uh, because since uh, bronchial thermoplasty is basically like you said, uh, you put incisions on the smooth muscles. So if you do not… So ma'am, uh, uh, how we approached in our patient regarding the selection of the yes. patient. So no? how do you select which patients yes, going to benefit? Yes, so what we initially did, uh, you need to have the history. Those individuals who had a history of repeated exacerbation in all those guidelines suppose that has a history of greater than two exacerbation or greater than one exacerbation requiring hospitalization or requiring oral corticosteroid use. Uh, who have history of frequent outpatient visit, who had to use multiple times. In those individuals, the problem which we faced regarding the selection of patient, in most of the uncontrolled asthma patient, uh, either most of them are using inhaler in an inappropriate manner after checking all those things. So the true percentage of patients usually have an FEV1 value of less than 60%. So only in a couple of patients we found that, in four patients we found that the FEV1 was greater than 60%. Then comes the role of biologicals. So then we check the eosinophil value, we check the Ig value and in those we individual we found out that the Ig level is less than 150 or the, there is absence of peripheral eosinophilia. In those individual, we gave and also the age, we um, thought about this age criteria. So in the two patients in which we use the bronchial thermoplasty, one is a 42 year old male and another is a 46 year old female. So in those, those two patients ma'am, we use bronchial thermoplasty and both of them had history of multiple times hospitalization actually. What I was wondering is that since you are putting incisions on the smooth muscle, 
the airway inflammation part needs to be looked into first. Absolutely, ma'am. Yeah, airway, so it doesn't take care of the airway inflammation. So that is why there is a very misconception among all patients also. And patients also you tend to ask us this question whether we will require the steroids or not after bronchial thermoplasty. So it doesn't have any effect on the airway inflammation. So I think we should uh, build a practice like uh, after you have con uh, conquered all the airway, you, not only eosinophils, neutrophils also. So once that is done and the BHR persists, we do not have the habit of uh, measuring bronchial hyperresponsiveness in this part of the world. So I would, uh, I think we, before doing a bronchial thermoplasty because you are targeting the smooth muscles, it does justify that we take care of the uh, inflammatory cells and the bronchial hyperresponsiveness. Okay ma'am, we will take your suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, really it is a eye-opening and uh, updated topic. And we have little experience on this. Again, a question comes to the selection of the patient, which is most important. And patient who is not responding to all sorts of conservative management, you are uh, giving the option for the thermoplasty. And you are dealing with the muscles, muscles, smooth muscles. And uh, we know that uh, if uh, poorly treated asthma after a long time develop uh, remodeling of the airway. And remodeling means uh, the involvement of the mucosa, muscle layer, fibrosis, etc. So is it essential uh, to identify the muscles hypertrophy in that cases? So uh, poor reversibility or uh, incomplete uh, persistent symptom, recurrent exacerbation, and you are giving criteria for the pulmonary function uh, less than or more than 60% and other IgE and inflammatory markers. But you are doing uh, your intervention uh, with the smooth muscles. So there are certain phenotypes of the patients having smooth muscle hypertrophy properly. <coughs> so significant fibrosis uh, may not be cured with this problem. So, uh, this is why, uh, the so is there any way to identify the patients who have predominantly smooth muscle hypertrophy in the bronchus? Like in the ultrasonography, endobronchial ultrasonography, does it help in any way? Or some imaging uh, matters, imaging uh, criteria? Do you need any such sorts of investigation to identify particular patients having smooth muscle hypertrophy? I think this will be the patient ideal for the, your intervention in these cases. Sir, in the inclusion and exclusion criteria of all the guidelines, if you go through, uh, there is not mention of what ma'am was also talking about the bronchodilator reversibility as well as regarding the assessment of the smooth muscle. What they tend to use to say why they are uh, more of favor of doing it less than 60 and they are not in favor of doing greater than 60 is because of the structural remodeling which takes place after that age. So the portion of the sub-epithelial collagen deposition or fibroblast portion is much more compared to what it was prior to less than 60 or those middle age groups. And this is why and also and now what the trials are also been doing is the biologicals versus bronchial thermoplasty to see whether money, it works in all phenotypes or whether it will work in only selective phenotype. So this question will only be the answer will be known after 5 to 10 years because all the head to head trials of thermoplasty versus it has already been started. What I have been told by the manufacturer company. Yeshoda of Hyderabad has done it uh, in India as well as the metro uh, Dr. Talwar in also the uh, TH2 predominant types or the in allergic individuals. So they are also going to probably publish their experience in India. Yeah, Debraj, it was an excellent talk. So one thing I would like to just ask you, do you think that if we, if we build up the uh, induced putum study, so that can be, that can help us in selecting the patients for the bronchial thermoplasty. Yes, I think. Because if we get a posse granulocytic picture, so we can know much before that these patients are not going to be helped by any of the medicines available. So maybe the bronchial thermoplasty may be the only treatment option for, for them. I think with more and more availability of labs doing those sputum eosinophil, this is a very important and pertinent 
observation which you noticed to all of us. I think with more and more availability, probably they will include these things. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Zebra just for enlightening us on such a uh, new modality. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. So I would like to invite Dr. Arun Sarkar, sir, to hand over the memento to Dr. W. Shraj, sir. Thank you for this wonderful session, sir. I would like to welcome Chairperson Dr. Brijesh, uh, Brijesh Mishra, sir, and Dr. Rashmi Kangori, sir, for the next uh, to chair the session, sir. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Brijesh Mishra, sir, and Dr. Rashmi Kangori, ma'am. I would like to request Dr. Rashmi Ganguri, ma'am, to invite uh, the speaker, Dr. Shyamal Sarkar, sir. Uh, warm good afternoon to everyone. I thank you, Dr. Nishad and team, to organize such a wonderful symposium out here. And may I request our next speaker of this session, Dr. Shyamal Sarkar, sir. He needs no introduction. He's the senior most pulmonologist of Jharkhand and with a, a vast knowledge and experience of more than 30 years, he is a mentor and guide to all the junior pulmonologists as well as other physicians practicing respiratory medicine. Sir has not been keeping yeah, well, but we thank you, sir. An important point I would like to, uh, wanted to highlight here, and uh, this uh, Gina also given very stress on this uh, recommendation. Is there any question? That Thank you, sir, for such excellent presentation. So what is the recommendation about the use of ICS beyond three months along with the LABA? Use of ICS? Beyond three months. Beyond three months? Uh, it should be continued throughout? Yes. Should we stop only LABA should be continued? No, it, it, it should it, stop it, the ICS? No, no. ICS treatment, whenever the patient is having more frequent symptom, that means the patient is having airway inflammation and it has been found that even if the patient is asymptomatic or in between the attack, the patient has some element of airway inflammation always persisting. And this is uh, equally in the allergic rhinitis as well as the, in the bronchial asthma. 
and this low grade airway inflammation which is persisting can result in development of the acute exacerbation on sudden exposure to pollens pollution pollution or weather change etc so if the patient has frequent symptom that is uh, suppose more than twice a month or once or twice a week so it indicates that the patient is having ongoing inflammation and he needs regular inhaled corticosteroid treatment so in that case you have to continue inhaled corticosteroid to keep the patient symptom free as well as reducing the risk of exacerbations yes no 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 so actually I, ICS is the main treatment for bronchial asthma ICS is the only treatment you cannot treat bronchial asthma without inhaled corticosteroid this is the drug of choice and depending upon the patient's level of symptom or frequency of exacerbations or the lung function deterioration so you have to step up or step down the inhaled corticosteroid dose but without inhaled corticosteroid you never treat bronchial asthma on the other hand for copd patient just for your information in copd patient bronchodilator are the drug of the choice not the inhaled corticosteroid this should be kept in mind in bronchial asthma inhaled corticosteroid is the drug of choice not the bronchodilator you can't use bronchodilator without ics it will be detrimental for the patient in the copd patient bronchodilator is the first choice and in few patients you have to continue ics inhaled corticosteroid so this is the uh, these are the copd and bronchial asthma these are the most common group of patients we come across in our clinical practice we have to differentiate we have to stamp the patient that this is copd so treat with bronchodilator and this is asthma treat with inhaled corticosteroid so there is a strict guideline here thank you sir for simplifying the topic yes yes i think there is no more question from the house i would like to uh, request dr brajesh uh, mishra sir to hand over the moment to, to dr shyam sarkar sir thank you sir i would like in, like i would uh, i would like to invite chairperson dr archana malik ma'am dr yogesh jain sir dr bikki ma'am to uh, chair the session warm welcome warm welcome to dr archana malik ma'am dr yogesh jain sir and dr bikki ma'am
I would like to request Dr. Arjuna Malik, ma'am, for the introduction of the speaker, Dr. Atri, sir. I am very much uh, thankful to Dr. Nisit, sir, to organizing this event. I would like to uh, invite our next speaker, uh, Dr. Atri Gangopadhyay, sir. He is a renowned pulmonologist, practiced in Ranchi. He is kept keen interest in research and academic activity. His research and uh, treatment area of interest are air pollution, pulmonary hypertension, and advanced PFT machine. And he is the first person to have impulse oxalometry uh, machine in the state. And he has delivered many uh, lectures uh, in national conferences and East Zone Conference. Also, he is a uh, East Zone Governor of Chest Council of India. Uh, stage is yourself. Please go with you. I understand I am separating all of you from your lunch, so I shall try to be brief, precise, to the point. Uh, this is the first time I am talking of on Fino in Ranchi. I have talked on Fino in various places. And this is the first time I am talking on an Apple laptop, so they are having some issues in getting the slides. So basically, I want to thank Orchid. I want to thank the Schiller people. May लुपिन का धन्यवाद देना चाहूँगा मैं डॉक्टर निशित जी का धन्यवाद देना चाहूँगा कि रांची में एडवांसेस ऑन अस्थमा पे एक प्रोग्राम हो रही है ताकि जितना लोग हम लोग यहाँ सुन रहे हैं हम लोग झारखंड को एटलीस्ट ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ अस्थमा में मोस्ट एडवांस्ड बना सके एट पार विथ रेस्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड सो थैंक यू फॉर दीज फोर पीपल हु आर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस प्रोग्राम कुछ कुछ चीज फिनो पे हम लोग देख चुके हैं कि फिनो क्या करता है लेकिन फिनो क्यों ऐसे करता है और फिनो कैसे ऐसे करता है उस पर मैं बात करूंगा नहीं इसको मेन विंडो में ही था ये वाला नहीं है ये निशित सर वाला है एंड मैडम बता रही थी कि जैसे मैंने सबसे पहले झारखंड में ऑसिलोमेट्री लाया मैं स्टेज का इस्तेमाल करूंगा बताने के लिए कि डॉक्टर निशित जी झारखंड में सबसे पहले फिनो लाए हैं और मैं उसी फिनो पे बात करूंगा फिनो इज़ नॉट जस्ट अबाउट अस्थमा इट इज़ अबाउट मेनी थिंग एल्स विच आई एम लर्निंग एज आई एम यूजिंग द मशीन बट आई एम ओनली गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट फिनो इन अस्थमा फुल स्क्रीन कैसे करोगे Optimizing asthma care in patients using pheno. The full form of pheno is fractional exhaled nitric oxide. My machine looks something like that. Now, in a practice, it's very difficult to convince a patient to do a PFT or a spirometry for the simple reason is it may cost money. Now, how do I convince a patient that I want you to do an even more expensive test than spirometry, which may cost you more money? So, what I tell my patients, I want to check the airway Sibyl score. Sibyl scores could get patients become very happy. Are ha, Sibyl score to aaj kal check hota hai. Or doctor sahab, mere saans ka airway ka Sibyl score check kar rahe. So, I compare a Fino score to a Sibyl score, and that's a hit. It's a quick objective assessment of airway. It is reproducible, very easy to perform and train, and most important, comfortable for the patient. The right spirometry can sometimes be very irritating, very painful for the patient. But very few patients express displeasure after a pheno. They were very happy. पहले मैंने सिबिल स्कोर का नाम लिया. Second, it's much less painful than performing a spirometry. The importance of nitric oxide only the late 1980s. Pyrometry is over a hundred years old. Even oscillometry is over 50 years old. But we know the concept has come only 1980 when certain scientists discovered that nitric oxide is so many important thing. And in early 1990s, presence of NO in human lungs. 1997, it was found that pheno levels vary depending on the exhaled air flow rate. What is the principle of this test? A little about MBBS biochemistry. 
nitric oxide produced by something from l arginine constitutive nitric oxide cnos inducible nitric oxide endothelial nitric oxide constitutive nitric oxide includes neuronal and endothelial which are mainly expressed in nerve cell and vascular endothelial cell so vascular endothelial related to pulmonary hypertension inducible nitric oxide is what we are interested in in our asthma it is expressed mainly in epithelial cells in addition to certain notorious cells known as macrophages and eosinophils lekin ye jo maine char naam liya constitutive uske do sub part aur inducible charo airways mein milte hain only difference is the constitution ya the concentration so basically anything which will increase the inducible nitric oxide will increase the no level in the airways and this is detected in the exhaled breath एंड कौन से ये सेल होते हैं यूसिनोफिल एंड मैक्रोफेजेस वी कैनॉट एड मिलीमीटर टू किलोमीटर वी कैनॉट एड अ थर्ड वर्ल्ड करेंसी टू अ फर्स्ट वर्ल्ड करेंसी सिमिलरली द कंस्टिट्यूटेबल नाइट्रिक ऑक्साइड इज इन द लेवल टेन पावर माइनस ट्वेल्व टू टेन पावर माइनस फिफ्टीन वेयर एज द इंड्यूसिबल नाइट्रिक ऑक्साइड जो हम लोग यहां मेजर कर रहे हैं दैट इज टेन पावर माइनस नाइन या पार्ट पर बिलियन पी पी बी what modifies the normal values il4 and il13 is something responsible in asthma inos expression is regulated by il4 il13 so corticosteroid which modulate this il4 and il13 production reduces the pheno values among the asthma patient anyone with atopy will have a higher pheno values smoking reduces pheno value so asthma patient after smoking 10 cigarettes if he comes for that pheno test can get a lower pheno value so this can be explanation of a lower pheno value in a patient who is wheezing very badly nasal allergies elevate pheno so allergic rhinitis plus asthma even more pheno and i am sure those chiller people out there they are coming up with something known as a nasal pheno also in asthma patient if we compare to other studies pheno positively correlate with sputum eosinophil bronchial biopsy eosinophil bronco alveolar lavage eosinophil queen so when head to head studies were done whether pheno is original or fake they found it to correlate with sputum bronchial biopsy bronco alveolar lavage thus asthma with atopic nature sino nasal allergy propensity to steroid treatment will have high pheno values well treated asthma steroid resistant asthma and smoker will have lower value so someone is wheezing coughing sneezing but pheno is coming normal or low it can be a peculiar phenotype known as steroid resistant asthma maybe you will have to think of something else neutrophilic inflammation and this il4 and il13 which is responsible for this nitric oxide are also important targets for various drugs and potential drugs in asthma a spirometry depends upon gender age height weight race what for pheno children something else adults something else dr maitra was talking that in children the airway surface lumen is totally different to that of adults so oscillometry values in children something else similarly pheno values in children something else but for adults age gender menstrual cycle gestation no difference at all in pheno no respect with respect to body weight or body mass index other modifiers from patient side what should i not do before a pheno test please avoid food and drink one hour before pheno certain food contains nitrates like salad leaves spinach root lettuce elevated pheno after consumption this wo jo popeye the seller cartoon dikhata tha us spinach khata tha us spinach kha ke pheno karane jayega to badha hua aayega usko steroid de dega osteoporosis ho jayega pata chala usko asthma nahi tha so avoid taking these food before a pheno test over consumption of alcohol sugar and lipid may reduce pheno concentration if someone is able to do a pheno test after a drinking binge and sober that can come a low pheno value nitroglycerin 
can readily release nitric oxide but it has a very high hepatic first pass metabolism so it does not alter the pheno concentration because the half life in blood is very short another very big confounder is active respiratory infection don't do a pheno test to know about asthma control in active respiratory infection because virus bacteria can acutely raise the pheno value but another indicator is you can get a pheno value to know whether patient is suffering active infection or not in the absence of let's say confounding blood parameters after forced expiration in spirometry the pheno can rise so we know can reduce for around 1 hour so if you want to get both pheno and spirometry please do pheno first spirometry later and bronchodilator reversibility pheno can increase after that bronchodilator so if you want to get a pheno test that day morning no bronchodilator please if i need pheno and spirometry in same patient i will do pheno first spirometry afterwards because spirometry can reduce the pheno value what are the values jo value value bol rahe the kya value hota hai bhaiya as per ats american thoracic society adults less than 25 wonderful children less than 20 wonderful matlab eosinophilic inflammation and response to corticosteroid are less likely or the steroids have worked wonderfully leading to a asthma control so you can step down treatment 25 to 50 for adults and 20 to 35 for children is that borderline zone above 50 for adult above 35 for children means there is uncontrolled eosinophilic phenotype asthma which person will respond wonderfully to steroid bahut samay हम लोग छोटे शहर में मरीज को इन्हेलर लिखने से मरीज के साथ उसके चार अटेंडेंट मुंह फुला लेते हैं कि आपने हिम्मत कैसे किया हमको इन्हेलर लिखने का सो यू कैन गेट अ फिनो टेस्ट डन शो द फिनो वैल्यू अब फिफ्टी एंड टेल ये साबित करता है कि आपको इन्हेल स्टीरॉयड से फायदा होगा सो दैट इज समथिंग वेरी ऑब्जेक्टिव एंड यू कैन सेटिस्फाई इवन द नेस्टी क्वेरी ऑफ द मोस्ट सस्पिशियस पेशेंट स्पेशली आफ्टर रीडिंग दो व्हाट्सएप सर्कुलेटिंग फेक मैसेजेस टू सीनारियोज वॉट इफ माई स्पायरोमेट्री इज नॉर्मल बट आई एम हैविंग सिम्टम्स इस आदमी ने इंडिया को वर्ल्ड कप जिताया बाद में पता चला इसको मैच के दौरान हिमोप्टिसिस होता था बाद में एक ट्यूमर निकला लेकिन बिफोर मैच सब प्लेयर लोगों का एक फिटनेस स्पायरोमेट्री होता है इसका स्पायरोमेट्री तो नॉर्मल आता था तभी उसको खेलने देता था सो ही हैड सिम्टम्स बट हिज स्पायरोमेट्री वॉज नॉर्मल द अदर वे अराउंड वॉट इफ माई स्पायरोमेट्री सीरियस एंड आई एम लैकिंग सिम्टम्स दिस जेंटलमैन इज अवी स्मोकर तो इनका अगर स्पायरोमेट्री होगा एफ ई वी वन पचास परसेंट से भी कम आ सकती है लेकिन ये तो बहुत फिट आदमी है पूरा मतलब स्टंट्स भी करते हैं डांसिंग भी करते हैं सो इज स्पायरोमेट्री इज एब नॉर्मल but he is not having symptom in dono scenario mein pheno can help you out how spirometry normal but patient is symptomatic pheno is raised this is a uncontrolled asthma with normal lung reserve but the patient is having uncontrolled asthma but up till now that fev1 or fvc has not started deteriorating may be due to a good respiratory reserve pheno normal spirometry normal and patient symptomatic you can consider non pulmonary causes of dyspnea like psychological metabolic something like dyslipidemia hypertriglyceridemia or can also cause dyspnea or cardiac so this is where a pheno will help you when spirometry is normal but patient is symptomatic and let's look the other way around spirometry abnormal but patient asymptomatic pheno is raised it can be brittle asthma just before me shamal sarkar sir was telling that what was previously known as mild asthma in them also 30% people couldn't die of asthma that was something earlier known as brittle asthma but now the term brittle asthma is slowly slowly being removed but if pheno is raised spirometry abnormal and patient is asymptomatic please be alert in that patient that patient has a risk of dying of an acute attack of asthma and if pheno is normal in such patient then that indicates a poor spirometry effort that may be the spirometry was not done properly or the calibration of the spirometry was not good get a spirometry done 
very shortly i will tell you about how we do it actually this is how the machine looks like and from the front from the back you can see there is a charger also so you can charge the machine use it without any power point the mouthpiece looks something like that and he is a uh, assistant in our clinic who uh, ag agreed to be the model you need to put your mouth on that mouthpiece and for adults you need to blow for 10 seconds for kids you need to blow for 6 seconds when you say start a screen something like this comes if you blow slowly and that pointer is in the yellow zone the test will disqualify if you blow very hard and the pointer goes in the red zone then also the test will disqualify means if you have lunch at 10 o'clock then also you can have problem if you have lunch at 3 o'clock then also you can have problem so you should blow such that the pointer is there in the green zone for those 10 seconds of children 6 seconds and then they will give you a result something like this uh we will see the demonstration in the workshop don't worry advantage over spirometry performance reproducibility objective koi isme confounding ya confusion nahi hoga it's a number interpretation very easy jo ats ne jo diya hai that is true all over the world what are its applications in asthma care diagnosis of asthma prognosticating asthma like we told how we could diagnose brittle, brittle asthma using a pheno monitoring response to asthma you started steroid for a pheno let's say above 5050 after one month the patient comes to you and the patient gives a pheno of less than 25 so you can tell the patient that my medicine is working this is proof and something known as ac or asthma copd overlap where the patient is a known case of copd but pheno is raised so that is a asthma overlap also if pheno is something so wonderful then why is it not widely and readily available what are its limitations this is not a measure of lung capacity and should never replace spirometry asthma mein aap spirometry pheno ek sath kariye for diagnosis follow up mein aap pheno akela kariye but initially you will need that spirometry unlike oscillometry which may actually replace spirometry in future except for pre op fitness an adult must be able to blow for 10 second or child for 6 second pehle aap ek baar trial karwa lijiye is the adult or the child able to blow tabhi karaiye warna mat karaiye but the third point very painful point the company who made pheno is so intelligent that they are even able to bind doctors commercial patent limitation by company i need to pay for every test even after purchasing the machine every test is chargeable by the company so i need to purchase those test via some otp passwords from the company maybe this is the reason why it is not yet so popular for example the machine shows the test remaining so many when the test remaining will come zero then my machine will not work and i will have to purchase additional test from the company so this is one drawback of pheno that it's not so popular yet and i want to thank all of you for your patience and if you are interested in pheno or if you are doing pheno you can definitely share with me and since this is a doctor audience i have also shared my number and email id thank you for your time i beg your pardon sir cost per one test myself i am charging 1200 rupees cost for one test because the limiting cost is that kit for per test i need to pay something to that company maybe that's why or it could have come much lower if i would be free of that please thank you for the enlightening talk dr athri any questions from the house nice stimulating talk three <laughs> my and multilingual uh, my question to you is that uh, you said that pheno does this does that compared to many many things uh, and i think you should have spoken about the adherence factor so the most important thing that we can assess with pheno is adherence because uh, when you see an inflammatory uh, thing going on you are, you cannot manipulate the drug doses because 
you have, I'm sure you know the reason, but still I'll uh, iterate that. Because you cannot differentiate between eosinophilic, neutrophilic, and anything else. So you see that the pheno levels are high. The only thing we know is that the patient has an ongoing inflammation. And second of all, if the patient is an asthmatic from the beginning, he, is, he or she is not taking the medications correctly. So that's it. And, and once again, thank you for your yeah. Pheno definitely talk. helps in adherence. Patient cannot bluff ki hum to inhaler lete hai. A pheno test can tell you whether patient actually inhaler lete hai ya nahi lete hai. Uh, the company sells those test OTP and mouthpiece together. So mouthpiece, since I am anyhow I have to pay for a mouthpiece, so it's disposable per patient. No, no, no. Uh, pheno is not related to significant response. Significant response is basically something like a bronchodilator reactivity. No, no, no. I am asking, suppose if the initial pheno level was 50, now said that after one month if it is less than 25, but no, if it is 40, then we will say is it is... No, there is no defined criteria yet. We just see whether the value is going down or coming up. Step up, step down as per pheno. That means that now we have come to know that bronchial asthma has different phenotype and one of the most uh, common phenotype is eosinophilic bronchial asthma. So if the patient has a bronchial inflammation, eosinophilic bronchial inflammation and pheno will diagnose that. But there are asthma without eosinophilic inflammation of the bronchus. As uh, previously discussed by the guest speakers here, that neutrophilic inflammation may have bronchial asthma, osigranulocytic inflammation may have bronchial asthma. So one particular section of the patient having eosinophilic airway patient inflammation, pheno can identify that. But asthma without eosinophilic inflammation, asthma with neutrophilic inflammation, so pheno cannot detect that patient with asthma. So this is uh, uh, for a diagnosis of pheno, so there is a shortcoming here. But uh, once you diagnose that the patient has eosinophilic asthma and you are prescribing ICS, then definitely for monitoring, for uh, escalating the dose or decreasing ICS, so there is definite role of pheno here. So what, uh, what uh, Atri has clearly uh, spoken here, that the utility of pheno in asthma diagnosis and what is the utility in asthma monitoring, monitoring for the inhaled corticosteroid treatment, etc. Thank you, Atri. Thank you. One thing, Atri, it was really nice. So, uh, though pheno and the blood eosinophils, they are being used now as a surrogate marker for the sputum eosinophils. But uh, there was a very interesting study, like this was done from our country, means by Dr. Das Gupta. So, it has shown that the correlation between the sputum eosinophils and pheno, it may not be the same. Why? Because it is important to understand that though we say that it's mainly to see the, whether the steroid responsiveness is there, adherence to treatment is there, but uh, to like translate it every time to the eosinophil, it may have uh, a caveat in that. Since it basically shows that interleukin-4, interleukin-13 mediated airway infl inflammation. So that is important, and these are the main important cytokines which causes the INOS synthase as activation leading to more of the nitric oxide in the airways. So, so conclude here. If there is no question, chairperson. Thank you, sir. I think there are no more questions. Mm -hmm. It was really fantastic. Thank you. I would like to request Dr. Yujesh Jain, sir, to hand over the memento to Dr. Atri, sir. Thank you.
After lunch, we will be coming back here only for the three sessions, three stations here only or that side. Next room. Okay. Uh, everyone is invited for lunch arranged outside the hall. Post lunch, everyone is cordially invited to advance PFT workshop organized next door. Thank you.